Good morning. Well, we have a hearty bunch here in the room. Was checking weather and it was like two degrees before I came inside. Anybody experience lower temperatures? Minus eight, all right. So welcome. Welcome to uh, Preserving Affordable Rental Housing, a look at tools and policies for our Denver audience. We also have a streaming audience joining us from, uh, last count, I think we had 15 states represented from uh, all the way from Florida, where it's nice and warm, I'm sure, up to Washington State, so from coast to coast. Uh, I'm Ariel Cisneros here at the Federal Reserve Bank of Kansas City, Denver branch, and uh, glad to have everybody here with us, joining us this morning, as I said, on this uh, nice, brisk morning. Uh, this conversation today is part of an ongoing conversation we've been having in regards to affordable housing, the affordable housing space. And, you know, first off, I wanted to, to thank uh, Beth Truby uh, with Chaffa as far as her work and her support. So a lot of the uh, conversation as far as putting the program together and elements and so forth. So public uh, recognition to Beth Truby. Thank you very much for your help and your support. Yes, please. So what I wanted to do is just kind of talk about a few things. Uh, one, one of the things that we're always finding is that there's not necessarily an understanding of the Federal Reserve. So I wanted to, to spend just a few minutes in regards to Federal Reserve Bank of Kansas City and the Community Development Office, because one of the things that we're finding is folks are saying, well, why are you guys in the affordable housing space? Or when we've worked on small business or workforce development, et cetera. And so one of the things that I wanted to touch on briefly before I bring up uh, the first panel of presenters is um, an overview, kind of in regards to the Fed. So for some of you that have attended past sessions, you've probably seen some of these clips. For others, probably could be new information. Uh, as you know, or for many of you, Federal Reserve System, decentralized system. We have the Board of Governors in Washington, D.C., and we have 12 regional uh, banks. We're in the Kansas City District, as you can see right there in the middle. Certainly our mandate in regards to uh, monetary policy, supervision and regulation as far as supervision of state member banks, uh, holding companies, and then financial services where the government's bank. So this is our district. So as you can see, we have our main office in Kansas City, Missouri, and we cover the states of our seven states here. I have colleagues in Kansas City, Nebraska, Oklahoma, and Colorado, uh, senior advisors like myself. And you're also gonna be hearing from our senior economist in community development, uh, Kelly Edmonston, a little bit later this morning. But wanted to give you, uh, again, a snapshot of our district community development office, you know, developed in the early 80s after the passage of the CRA, the Community Reinvestment Act in 1977, and which encourages banks to lend throughout their communities, including low and moderate income areas. So what we do is we focus on our, our research. Uh, you'll be here, as I said, hearing from Kelly, our relationships and our resources. Uh, we look at areas such as affordable housing. Today is, is uh, one such example. You know, some of the other things that we've been working on out of, out of this office is uh, earlier in the year, some of you that uh, provide housing counseling. We've supported the uh, housing counselors throughout the state of Colorado. Uh, those of you that uh, have been part of the, the foreclosure crisis and, and, and played a, a role in that, uh, the hotline, and we've supported the hotline since inception. Uh, manufactured housing, which was a discussion last year with CFED and kind of other programs as well that we've, uh, we've looked at and uh, in the affordable housing space. Community development investments, area that I'm responsible for. We're looking at the CRA related uh, activities. Um, in another slide, I'll be chatting about some of the resources that we have that uh, tie into CDI, community development investments which actually encompasses all of our focus areas, the affordable housing, community development investments, financial health, uh, think of that as uh, asset building strategies, financial education, so forth, and we have programs uh, for adults that we focus on in community development, and my colleagues in public affairs focus on K through 16 uh, education. I'll, I'll be sharing some links on that as well. And small business economic development, 
uh, those of you that are part of uh, CDFIs, micro-lending CDFIs, or CDFI-like entities, that work. Um, and also one of the things that uh, some of you may have seen that are in the small business space is um, a new survey that's uh, going to be out in uh, 2017 first quarter in regards to our uh, access to credit for small businesses. So that'll be uh, interesting information. Uh, workforce development, some of the activities that we have there with the uh, Aspen Institute and other players uh, throughout the state. And we have some representatives here in the room that kind of touch on uh, quite a few areas that we have here, uh, including the workforce. So snapshot, I thought this was interesting. This was something that we developed um, just to give an idea of some of the things that uh, we've been working on that we worked on in 2015. And just to put that in context, as far as, you know, so 60 programs delivered presentations, you can see where they were. I think this is still missing some of the national webinars uh, and streaming sessions that we did because we've, we've touched quite a few states. Um, community investments, at that time it was 25.7. We're right at about 28 million now, and that's our investment connection program where we connect community development organizations that have a CRA eligible proposal with funding organizations, that's financial institutions that are looking for CRA opportunities. It's um, funders as far as foundations, uh, government, state, federal, local. So those kinds of activities. So again, here's some touch points as far as our um, community development office in 2015. We've been looking at that and we're kind of hitting um, beyond this as far as for 2016. So we'll have some new numbers next year. So. Here's some of the highlighted uh, uh, programs and products that I wanted to, to quickly share. Community Connections is a newsletter that goes out um, every few weeks. And if you're not part of that, would like for you to you know, consider connecting and through our website and it basically some of the activities that are occurring not only within our district, uh, and again, you, you saw the, our areas of focus, but also some of the national um, activities that are, that are taking place putting your paycheck to work in regards to, you know, this isn't just for, um, we think of the, the, the organizations that we're serving and so forth, often it can be your own, your own employees in many cases. Investment connection that I talked about, as far as connecting community development organizations with funding uh, sources, it's been great in regards to not only the actual dollars, but in regards to making sure that the funding community is aware of some of the issues and the challenges uh, that exists in our community. So it's a great way to share information as far as the work that your organization is doing in that particular space. So uh, along with place-based, we also have an online portal. So basically you can, uh, if you're a funder, you basically go and say, I'm looking for um, workforce development opportunities in Colorado, check the box, I want to make a, a loan or an investment, check those boxes, and it'll populate it with those proposals that are appropriate. Um, for you. CRA One Source, probably more familiar for the bankers in the room. It's basically a um, guide in regards to templates, resources, uh, webinars, other things in regards to how to make your job easier as a CRA officer. Um, grow Your Own, a uh, product from uh, one of my colleagues in uh, Delgines in uh, Omaha, Nebraska, in regards to entrepreneurial communities. So toolkit there, and com CEDAR, Community Development Investment Resource Guide, another tool that's available to uh, funders, probably more so for financial institutions that are looking for uh, CRA eligible activities. So here's some of the links. Um, uh, for those of you that are streaming online, uh, the PowerPoints, and actually for the audience here as well, all of the PowerPoints are gonna be loaded on our website. Uh, this afternoon, so they will be available, so you'll have all of those links. But with that, I wanted to uh, then move on to our panel. So I wanted to give you the quick overview in regards to the Community Development Office and the Federal Reserve Bank of Kansas City Community Development Office. Um, this conversation, as I said, is ongoing in regards to housing. I mean, I could, uh, uh, one of the conversations that we were having earlier one of, with one of the presenters is anecdotally we continue to hear of the, uh, our community members that are often faced with these increasing rents. You know, a recent example of another one I had where rent's going to be going up $200 a month 
for this family and you know their income is not going up by $200 a month. Uh, other situations where you know, I've met with the owners of a, a complex, small complex in many cases, and they're, it's their small business. And they're seeing their costs rise. And so, of course, it comes from raising rents and so forth. So that's a small business. So it's, it's this, you're torn between, you know, certainly the, the resident and the, the person, the workforce that needs affordable housing. But along with that, you have the owners of some of these properties uh, that are looking to make sure that the properties are still safe and secure and trying to address their cost issues as well. So not, not always a simple answer uh, with that. Um, what you're gonna be hearing through the presentations is quite a bit of the, the opportunities, the strategies, the programs that are in place, uh, hopefully that we'll be seeing more of in, in 2017 and that they'll be sharing that with us, some of the practices. Uh, logistics that I'd like to share for our streaming audience, um, and for our audience here in Denver, please, uh, we will have microphones for the questions. So if you have questions for our speakers, please uh, use those. Wait for, we'll have uh, uh, folks running with microphones, so we'll have those available because we do have the streaming audience. Also for the streaming audience, I think uh, you have the banner in regards to the number to call, 303-903-6246, so that you can text your questions. And uh, with that, uh, oh, also, just one more thing for the, the streaming audience, I want you to be aware. We do have uh, two breaks that are taking place, and those will be noted uh, on the screen, but we hope, do hope that you stay connected. And with that, I'd like to pass it on to Chris White, Executive Director and CEO of Chaffa, to moderate this panel. And I'd like also, oh, his bio is in, for all of our presenters, are in the packet. And along with Chris, would like to welcome him and also say publicly, he's a new member of our Community Development Advisory Council for 2017. So Chris, welcome. Great. Thanks, everyone. All right, good morning, everyone. Good morning. Just want to make sure this is working okay? Yep, okay, great, excellent. Ariel, thank you very much, and it's, it's really, I'm really looking forward to being part of that advisory board. I think that's gonna be a lot of fun, and hanging out with you a little bit more often as well probably won't hurt either. Uh, welcome, everybody, and uh, thanks for braving the very cold <laughs> weather this morning. We're glad you're all here. Um, I would like to start our uh, first session today um, talking about preserving rental, uh, affordable rental housing, um, talking a little bit about the term um, affordable housing and maybe defining that for you a little bit. That's a term that sometimes can be a little bit polarizing and it has different meanings to different people. So let me, let me suggest to you what I think is a good definition of affordable, of affordable housing. I would suggest that as a low to moderate income person, regardless of where you are on the affordability or the income spectrum, so whether you earn at or below 30% of the area median income or you earn pick a number, 150% of the area median income. Ideally, there would be housing stock that's affordable to you. That would be ideal. And by affordable, we mean spending no more than 30% of your adjusted gross income towards your housing costs. So that's what we mean by affordable housing. Um, in, the, in Colorado, we have approximately 750,000 renter households. Of that 750,000, approximately 49% of them pay 30% or more of their adjusted gross income towards rent. Of that number, 24% are heavily cost burdened. That means they pay more than 50% of their gross income towards their housing costs, towards their rent costs, rent and utilities. When you're paying that much of your income towards rent, that means there's less money available for very important things like transportation, and healthcare, and in some extreme cases, that means some people are making the decision between paying for their housing and how much they're going to eat. So that's why this idea of preserving affordable housing is so expensive. Now, those statistics I gave you are based on Colorado, but they also aren't unique to Colorado. For those, so for those that are listening in, those statistics tend to, tend to uh, carry over into other states as well. When you think about those statistics in the context of the low-income housing tax credit, of which Chaffa is the uh, allocator in the state of Colorado. I would suggest to you that the low-income housing tax credit is the single greatest tool for the development and the preservation of affordable housing. Um, however, 
uh, we get, we here in Colorado, get about roughly $12 million a year in tax credits to allocate. Uh, we, we have, though, demand for that credit of about $35, $36 million a year. So put another way, for every $1 we have in tax credits to allocate, we have about $3 in demand. And that is every single year. So that would suggest to me, and I would suggest to you, that that means that this issue of housing affordability is something that we cannot build ourselves out of. We can't build this problem away. And that's why the concept of um, preservation becomes so important. Now, a little bit later today, I think at the 1045 session, you're going to hear a, a little bit more from Beth Truby, who's on my team at Chaffa. Uh, we're going to talk a, a quite a bit more detail about what we're doing with several other partners in terms of attacking this uh, initiative of, um, of uh, housing preservation. So you'll hear more on that a little bit later. But for now, what I'd like to do is uh, introduce you to a couple of experts at the federal level who are going to talk to us about their programs and, initi and initiatives. Uh, first, we're going to hear from Aaron Gagne, who's the uh, director of the Office of Community Planning and Development with the US Department of Housing and, Ur and Urban Development with HUD. And then after we hear from Aaron, we will hear from uh, Tony Hernandez, who's the administrator of the Rural Housing Services with USDA. Guys, come on, come on up if you'd like. Aaron, we'll let you kick us off. Hey, Aaron, take it away. Do we have a mic yet? Yes, no? Yes? Okay, we have a mic. Um, sincere thanks to the Federal Reserve Team for including us in this discussion today. Um, and, and thanks everybody for braving it. I wanna put a little bit of a human face on it to start. Uh, and it's based on about four hours I spent on the phone last night with the local government here in the Front Range, getting four families housed in an emergency shelter situation. All four families lived in a fourplex, uh, sort of a cascading set of events with a boiler going out and then pipes freezing and the building becoming uninhabitable. Um, those folks don't have a safety net. Those folks don't have discretionary income to go to a hotel. Those folks didn't have a whole lot of options. So they needed to be placed in housing right now. Uh, those are folks, families with children, families with small children, and from my perspective, it's trying to put that human face on what we're doing with affordable housing every day and those connections. What I'm gonna talk about it a little bit is sort of an inverted pyramid, um, big broad brush policy, big broad brush national policy uh, initiatives, and then take it right down to what are we doing with our partners? How are we cultivating our partners? and how can we as an affordable housing community of practice become better connected and better engaged across federal agencies all the way down through nonprofit development community. So at a, at a national level, you know, HUD's got sort of five big broad brush goals, starting with the creation and preservation of affordable housing. That's why we're here. We're gonna talk about that in a little bit more detail. But Economic resilience and sustainability is a key for us. That, that economic resilience and sustainability to do things like weather the turns in oil prices, to weather natural disasters, uh, to help communities mitigate effects of climate change and, and more severe weather events that have driven issues such as flooding in Minot, North Dakota, or disaster recovery needs and demands in Boulder County here in Colorado. Uh, we've got teams right now out of our office in Denver, staff that are working the issues in North Carolina, in, in Texas, in Louisiana, uh, as well as our, our sort of home region issues. The eradication of homelessness um, obviously has been a, a massive priority for us, one that we've really been able to move the needle pretty effectively on, uh, but we have so far to go. Uh, we've had emphases on veterans homelessness, and we've seen close to a 50% reduction in veterans homelessness, unsheltered veterans homelessness across the country. We, we've got a target uh, of eliminating family homelessness. Um, and and these, are, these are multi year, sometimes decade long programs and projects because it didn't, it's not a situation that rose up overnight. 
And lastly, economic development. And that really gets, from my perspective, to the base of a community and to the structural economy of a community, which not only provides services, but provides jobs. And by providing jobs, you're providing that means to an end to get into safer, better housing for families. The affordable housing creation concept in and of itself, uh, we feed about five different large-scale programs. Uh, but at the same time, we're in a condition where we have to mix and match. The Home Investment Partnership Program is one of our oldest and longest standing for the actual construction and rehabilitation of affordable housing. Uh, it's a complex program. It's a program that has declined somewhat uh, in the last 10 years or so. Uh, but it continues to be an anchor for many development opportunities. Low-income housing tax credit program uh, is one that Chris and his agency ably, ably manage here for the state of Colorado and then the different housing finance agencies throughout our region is really a, fu a funding key. Uh, probably everybody in this room has, uh, has looked at LIHTC, has, has worked their way through a LIHTC process uh, and really understands the benefit of that capital infusion to projects. One of the newest kids on the block, even though it's been on paper for quite a long time, is the National Housing Trust Fund. Uh, we have just in the last few months issued our first grant agreements uh, to states within our region. Um, all of our states are sized such that each receive the minimum $3 million threshold. Uh, but we're hopeful that that's just the beginning. Uh, $3 million is not a big capital infusion, but we're seeing it as plugging gaps. Community development block grants. Community development block grant, the CDBG program, is one of the longest standing programs that my shop administers. Uh, most people don't really often think of it, though, as a traditional affordable housing development program. I would argue to the contrary, because there are lots of associated components of affordable housing that CDBG can get involved with, things like offsite infrastructure, uh, in, in, in high water demand areas like Colorado, things like water taps, uh, things like offsite park development costs, and, and other layers of, of fees and, and sort of associated improvements that aren't necessarily the bricks and mortar walls of your affordable housing. What this all comes down to, though, ultimately, for us in our programs, uh, especially as time has gone on, uh, and, and I was able to witness for better than 20 years as a grantee, is we have to mix and match. We have to leverage each of these programs against each other. There is no more one silver bullet. There is no more one single program uh, that's going to help us get there. So that's going to lead me sort of to, uh, sorry, this was a little out of order for me. Um, uh, that's going to lead me to some remarks about where we want to take the community planning and development programs. The affordable housing preservation, let's specifically talk about preservation for a moment. The rehabilitation programs is really about uh, bringing the condition, bringing the livability conditions up to, to standard. Some of those are being a little bit more standardized across like housing trust fund programs and, and the home investment partnerships program. Uh, we're also looking at the Rental Assistance Demonstration Program, the RAD program across the country, where HUD is sort of getting out of an ownership role and, and transferring that ownership to private industry, private operation. We've had very successful transfer of almost 300 units in the front range of Colorado so far. Uh, it is a demonstration program at this point, uh, but I think it's bearing fruit nationwide so we can continue hope to continue to see many of those transfers take place. We have an active preservation work group, which is multi-agency. Uh, it, it gets involved with uh, everyone from HHS uh, to EDA to, uh, to USDA uh, and multi-offices, multiple offices within HUD to really identify what are the needs, what are the issues, and what are the different resources that we can bring to bear. We're transferring project-based uh, investments, transferring project-based uh, investments from site to site uh, across the market. And then we've got a mark-to-market program uh, that's specifically out of our multifamily. Each of these is focused on 
retaining the numbers, retaining the number of units, retaining the quality of the units, and keeping those affordability price points down, uh, addressing everything from uh, what's happening in submarkets, where we're doing submarket studies to really understand what's happening to rent demands and vacancy demands, uh, all the way through the adjustments of fair market rents. Uh, we're not as nimble with those fair market rents as we would like to be. Uh, and I, w I, will, I will say that having been a grantee for a long time, um, those fair market rents are a challenge because ultimately local markets are far more volatile uh, than we can always respond to. Uh, but those are, those are areas that we're trying to work through. Place-based initiatives, and, and here's where I want to talk about maybe changing the script a little bit on how we have engaged with the affordable housing development community and with communities. Traditionally, uh, community planning and development has very much functioned in a role of an administrator and a monitor and an auditor of those dollars that flow through. That's not going to change, and that can't change because we have you know, legal responsibility for those public dollars that flow through into programs and projects. But what we can start to do is, is listen a whole lot better. Uh, and and that's, that's where we're trying to put a tremendous amount of our effort. Um, our regulatory programs historically have driven projects. Uh, we're trying to shift that discussion. We're trying to flip that to focus with communities on what do they want to be? What are their issues? What are they trying to fix? What are the problems? What do they want to be when they grow up? Uh, it, it, it sounds a little flippant, but that really is sort of a question we're trying to get to. If we as an organization can understand that, then we collectively, uh, HUD, as, along with all of our partners, can really start to say, OK, well, if you're trying to achieve X, let's get you connected with programs Y and Z and maybe programs A and B that you didn't even know about uh, because we're doing a better job of farming your project internally. It's mix and matching those programs and the assistance. It's looking at an affordable housing program, uh, perhaps in a very rural area, and looking at a combination of USDA investment, and home investment partnerships dollars, and CDBG dollars, and perhaps some, some emergency solutions grant dollars if we want to look at some of the very low income or permanent supportive housing types of concepts. And, and then really looking at those, those cross-agency opportunities. Uh, we've started to see some permanent supportive housing projects, for example, that, engage, that have brought USDA, HUD, uh, and HHS to the table uh, to provide different mixes of services and different mixes of investment. We were also, frankly, trapped in a situation in some markets like Denver where it's a capacity issue. Uh, there's a capacity issue of there are veterans in shelters with vouchers in hand that can't find a unit to live in. There are situations across our market where We've had a, uh, an eligible family with a voucher with deposit assistance that, that has been sort of pre-vetted and pre-cleared as tenants that have had to go to over 100 locations to actually get a lease signed uh, because the demand is so high. That said, you know, it still comes back from my perspective to what are the issues? What are the issues and, and where are we going to take this with communities? It's us getting in the door earlier, uh, talking to some of the Housing Colorado folks just this morning about the, the concept of how do we get an entree into communities, projects, and programs sooner rather than later uh, so we can have a discussion about what we bring to the table uh, for us to provide some guidance, for us to provide some institutional knowledge, for us to help folks navigate that sort of regulatory world that we must live in but also to help them achieve their community goals and objectives. Those goal, goals and objectives are going to remain both preservation and creation of affordable housing. Uh, I can't say, honestly, there's, there's a single market that I'm aware of in the Rocky Mountain region that can say we have an excess of affordable housing. They may have an excess of housing, but it's not really affordable or attainable, uh, as we started to hear about with folks spending 40, 50 percent plus uh, of their family income. Uh, so with that, um, I think we want to move over to some USDA. Sure. Okay. 
Well, good morning, guys. How are you? Yep, help me understand the, the audience. How many of you are nonprofits here? Raise your hand if you're a nonprofit. Well, hi there. Nice to see you guys. It's good to be back. How many of you are private owners? Right? How many of you are local governments? Who came for the free breakfast? <laughs> well, great. Hey guys, I'm very proud to be here. I'm with USDA. We are the largest investor in the state of Colorado and the rest of the states when it comes from the federal government. We invest more money than people ever think of. And one of the major investments we happen to do happens to be community development, housing, jobs. Matter of fact, it's jobs, housing, transportation, education, healthcare, public safety, and environment all come from USDA. If you have not asked for money from us, you are missing an opportunity. This is our great partner. Stand up with me for a second. This is a great partner. HUD is very important. But they have more money. We have, we, no, 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 you have a lot of money. <laughs> but this is another great partner. If you are not working with the Housing Finance Authority in every state, matter of fact, you're missing an opportunity. We have a great opportunity. We just had a major election. You guys heard about that one? Just happened? You hadn't heard about it? <laughs> you guys are sleeping. There was a big election just happened, and it's going to affect community development in many ways. And so I'm going to talk about what USDA does, but I'm going to link it to how we partner to try to preserve affordable housing, what I call is workforce housing. And the reason, uh, I spent most of my life here in Colorado, and just like you, we've heard of terms like affordable housing, attainable housing, workforce housing, but the words I heard most of the type of nope. Have you ever heard of nope? Not on planet Earth will you build that sucker here? Banana, build absolutely nothing near anything anyway. <sighs> That's one. Cave people. Cave people, what is that one? Citizens against virtually everything. I know, isn't that amazing? <laughs> But the thing that's happening right now across the country, not just here in Colorado, but everywhere, is the lack of people for jobs. And the biggest barrier to retaining jobs right now is workforce housing. I'll give you an example. I'm working with Tyson's Food in Texas, Oklahoma, Arkansas, and every place. They cannot find workers. Why? There is no workforce housing for them. So when I work with mayors in Thornton or here in um, Antonito or La Junta, all those places, you know, sometimes you want to talk about housing. Or if you go to other states within your region, you do want to talk about housing, but if you want to talk to folks that are now focused on housing, they are not housers. They are job creators. And so if we can spend more time with job creators, talking about how we help them get employees. An example, in Colorado, I work with a, a partner up in some rural resort, I think it's called Snowmass. We still have Snowmass here, someplace like that. Uh, they could not, I think it's Snowmass, they could not find workers to pave the highways going up to the, to the mountain. The sheriffs and all those folks live on the other side of the divide because they needed workforce housing. So working with this, you may want to look at a tool called employer-assisted housing. I'll get my real marks here in a second, but I'm just trying to filter it a little bit. The focus is to talk about jobs with housing. Do not do the other. The reason we have an opportunity, that town I was talking about, they contributed $80,000 in a forgivable loan for their employees. If they took a job, worked there, they would forgive the loan. If they moved away, they had to repay the money, or if they sold the house, they had to repay the dollars. It's another way to get access to capital. So just trying to change the discussion. The housing is important, but you have to connect it to jobs and workforce housing. I'd encourage you to talk about workforce housing more than just affordable housing, but we have to find a way to preserve this. What we're doing here, I have a nice chart for you. This is a chart that shows that USDA website, you should go to our website. In partnership with all of our owners, we happen to have for multifamily, that's what we're going to talk about right now is multifamily, 14,000 properties across the country. We used to have 16,000, we used to have 18,000, we used to have 20,000. They're all going away. We lose 100 to 200 properties every year for people getting out of the program. Most of these were built in late 70s and 80s, 40, 50 year mortgages. They are coming to do what we call maturing mortgages now. They are coming out and they can leave. Most of our owners, because unlike HUD, because HUD is getting rid of their properties now, all of our properties are owned by the private sector and nonprofits. We own nothing. We just provide what we call rental assistance, something like a Section 8, but not quite the same. It's a little different, to the properties. That rental assistance is about $1.4 billion every year in rental assistance. Every year. And it goes up. Last year was 1.389, 1.4 this year, 1.45. It grows every year, but our properties are shrinking. So our goal is, well, how do we work with the Housing Finance Authority? And Chris and his team here have really done something. I want to thank Beth. Where's Beth? At? Beth, Beth doing great stuff. They helped put together a new website that helps identify the properties that are maybe leaving the program, not providing affordable housing anymore. I think there's about 27, something like that. How many, Beth, in Colorado? 
12 student fees. That's more than 27 <laughs> properties. properties that may be leaving the program. That's the total of like How many could be leaving the program because of maturing mortgages or ta tax credits? In the next three years, there's about 150 properties okay. that have a carve-out. Right. This is very important to know because this is how you create partnership. What we've done, we've gone from every state, if you look up here, and it has a number on it. It tells you all the properties that will be leaving our program, not just from tax credits, but because of maturing mortgage and tax credits, because sometimes they're connected together. The purpose of this is to provide more transparency and create partnership for our nonprofits, local governments, and the private sector to start discussions for transfer of properties. So I can get them from one person who wants to sell it to somebody who wants to buy it. We're having buyer-seller conferences all over the country, trying to connect the two. And what I encourage every state within Ariel's region is to host those buyer-seller meetings in partnership with the federal partners who hold the, the contracts or with your housing finance authority so we can facilitate the transfer of property. The reason, we need to preserve that property. We have tools that make that happen. So in Colorado, we have 134 properties that will be leaving the program here in the next few years. This goes up to year 2029. Now, it took a lot to get this data. That's one of the hardest things is getting the right data because we have multiple loans on all our properties, multiple loans. We gave the first loan back in 1970. We gave another loan for rehab. We gave another loan for, it's amazing. There's about four or five, six loans on this property. And they have what we call 530, a guaranteed loan and a loan, another low income housing tax credit to come back and rehab the properties. So you may want to go to our website. In your packet, on this website, it'll have the link for you to go. And I have a person's name that you should call to get this information. But you can click on the state. It'll bring up all the properties in that state. You can click on that property. It'll bring up the principal balance on that state, on that property in that state so you can start discussion with the owner who's listed on there to preserve the properties. The reason that's so important, here's an example. So you can see I just took the western states. Uh, we look at the country a little different than Ariel does. We do four regions. We have eastern, metro, da -da, western states. So this western state just shows you all the states that will be losing property in the next few years. Again, click on the button. You can find out those properties. Start the discussion. Now, what's nice about USDA, we are very local. You talk about place-based, which is so important. I thank uh, HUD for doing place-based initiative. This is very, very important. We do it as well. We have in every state our office. I want to thank Senator Bennett's staff. Where's Ann? Is Ann here? Where's Ann? Senator Bennett and his staff and uh, Corey Gardner's staff, if they're here too, they're very, very, very supportive of USDA. Uh, we get lots of money. So that's why I tell you we're part of the largest investor. But we have staff in every state. And here we have Trudy Karras is our state director. And in every state, there is a state director in housing, community development, and all those program staff. The reason is place-based makes a difference. We have people that come and help you fill out the application, be more competitive so you can get. We don't have a lot of grants. HUD has more grants than we do. We have more loans than they do. $29 billion is what we have almost every year. $29 billion. Can you imagine that? Multifamily is not that much. It's about 38 billion, I'm sorry, 38 million, and about another 158 million. But it's a lot of money. You can do it. So the purpose of this tool is to help you find ways to preserve more properties. An example of this is really important. We have a number of tools. If you're currently in our program, we want you to stay there. And to stay there, we're going to do things to encourage you to be there. We will defer it, the loan again for another 20 years. We'll reamortize the loan. We just want you to stay in the program. Most of our owners are 75 to 80 years old. They would like to get out of the business. That's why we want nonprofits or a private company with partnership with nonprofits so you can get the low-income housing tax credit to come together and preserve those properties. So we're trying to do this across the country, but to do that, you need to create an incentives. That's why I think what Chaff and the other housing finance authorities across the country are doing is creating more access to the data and low-income housing tax credit so people can make choices and make strategic action. They call these confidence windows. What they don't call them is they're too small for my eyes. <laughs> So I have to look this way. Okay, here we go. <clears throat> another tool you may want to look at is what we call policy map. Policy map is another tool that working with a nonprofit. The nonprofit's name is called policy map. And the purpose of this nonprofit is to create an investment map. It includes HUD's data, USDA data, civil rights data, commerce data. You can do a civil rights analysis for your multifamily property going to one location. Click on it, you'll find all the federal investment in one place. Not, not all agencies yet. We're still working with folks to do this. But USDA data is there for single family, multifamily, and community facilities. And the reason is because when you build housing, you're building community. Workforce housing needs other things besides a house. I need transportation modes. I need other things. So you can see investments. So if you're trying to provide an incentive for a 
owner to transfer their property to somebody else, another owner. There are other investments that will be occurring around that property that will provide the right incentive, we believe, or you can come and ask for more money. Now, what's nice about preservation is that some of the people will live a long time, some will die sooner, some are ready to get out of affordable housing or workforce housing to buy into home ownership. Both their program and ours are what we call escalators to home ownership. So although we're really talking about preservation, you have to make sure you have the exit tool for folks so they can become homeowners. I'm gonna give you a tool you may wanna look at. It's called our 523. I love federal government. I've only been in federal government three years. It is amazing. I had to learn numbers and acronyms. The reason they use numbers, I wanna thank Senator Bennett and everybody else in the federal government, when they write a statute, the section line in the law is called 523. So it doesn't have a fancy name, it has 523. That's what our 523 site prep money, I have $5 million every year at 3% money, you can get that money to acquire a land and do site prep. Five years repayment at 3% money, what a deal. Please. Until I got there, they were not using that money, it was sitting there not being used. So you might wanna look at the federal government budget, we have great budgets. Look at last year's use. Where do they not use the money? You should go after those things. Because usually it's because we're not marking that money. We've lost the staff for that money. But we're trying to find ways to do more preservation. So this is a map that shows all these little dots. All those little dots are multifamily properties in every state. Now, if you see the big one, you're going to see it looks like a, a movie from an infectious disease. There's a lot of them but there's not enough. The demand for workforce housing in every state is growing, not getting less. So in Pueblo, they have this one here. The other part is continue to focus on the customer. The customer is the tenant. We have to find ways to always protect the tenant. And that's why we need to educate Congress on that this is a great opportunity. We have a new incoming president who talks about the importance of infrastructure. The major part of infrastructure across the country is housing. But people don't talk about housing as infrastructure. They talk about it as a separate component. Housing is a major infrastructure connected. For example, when I worked with the mayors here in Denver, the Metro mayors, we used to talk about, we want to put housing over there, but the jobs are over there. And I would say, well, mayor, that means you're spending a lot of time doing transportation pavements all the time. How do we provide an incentive to build the housing where the jobs are at? For example, in Antonito and Alamosa, I was working in a number of places there. The land is cheaper outside the town, even in Alamosa, outside of the town, downtown area but now they have to pay more gas to go outside. Now, I know gas is cheap now, right now, but with uh, uh, OPEC is just reducing their, their char charges, production, which means the price of gas is gonna start to go up again. So you have to do that linkage of jobs, housing, transportation, all those things come together. So find a way to focus on the customer, advocate per preservation. Maybe get a change of law that we need your help on. Right now, when our properties mature, if there's a prepayment, our tenants are protected by law, because we can issue them a voucher. If the property matures and they get out because they don't have to have a loan anymore, those tenants are at risk because there's no law that protects them. They cannot get access to a voucher. So we proposed for the last three to four years a law that would provide protection for tenants in a maturing mortgage property to get access to vouchers, which means you're gonna have to increase the, the value of vouchers. We have to get more vouchers because there's more people. Congress has been supportive, but they have not passed the law. So, Corey and, and Michael, would you guys please work on that again to see if we can get that passed here? It's not going to happen now. Congress is going to go for holidays here pretty soon. But in the new administration, we have a great opportunity. Whether you like the new incoming president or not, there's a great opportunity. When chaos comes, there's lots of opportunity. And when a new president comes, there's lots of opportunity because they look at everything trying to figure out what's going on. Here's the next opportunity I want to talk to you about. Real quick one. HFAs are really, really important. But what we're trying to do in USDA is make sure our appointments to the new administration come from the communities that understand workforce housing. I would encourage you, Ravi, come here, stand, come here, come here, Ravi. <laughs> I know Ravi. I, come here, come here, you two guys, come here, come here, come here. These are two of my friends, Florence and Flo. Wouldn't this be nice to have appointments from Colorado and every state, people that understand our industry, to be the Rural Housing Administrator right here. Give a round of applause, here it's Flo. Okay, it's a great job. And Ravi, he's now the Undersecretary for Rural Development. Wouldn't that be nice? <laughs> okay, sit down, thank you very much. I, I know we're laughing at this, but if you don't advocate right now for appointments, we will lose, lose an opportunity. Or matter of fact, we just pass it on to somebody else. So this is the time to do that. So we have a great opportunity. Part of it is we have to find ways to make more 
more success on tribal lands, guys. Here, even here in Southern Colorado, uh, the Mountain Utes and the Southern Utes, the workforce housing and affordable housing is very limited. In every state, it's hard to get housing. Now, we have some new MOUs coming out with the USDA partnership with HUD in the process of reunion, but we have to find some people that see infrastructure housing as infrastructure. So, when we work together with the private sector, nonprofits, local governments, housing finance authorities, state governments, we achieve three things. Oh, I love this stuff, guys. It's just amazing. First, we give people hope for workforce and home ownership, workforce housing and home ownership. Second thing, we give people a surprise that we can give all these entities like the Federal Reserve and other entities coming together to change people's lives, that we can work together. And the most important thing we give to people when we have hope, surprise, we give people joy. They have a safe and decent place to live. We need you. We need you now. Now is the time to volunteer, step up, and do more. Because you guys, I'm speaking to the choir here, I know I am, but we need you more than ever to push the envelope, not just ask for money, but ask for flexibility and creativity to improve people's lives. Thank you very much. Okay. Well, Aaron and Tony, thank you very much. Uh, we've got plenty of time to uh, take some questions if you'd like and hear a little bit more and more detail from our experts if you'd like. Chris, I'd like to amplify one thing, and, and I brought it up initially, Tony, uh, absolutely ran forward with the flag. A and that is that we need you to open the door for us to help you deliver your projects and programs. Uh, we need to find a way to be at the table sooner rather than later so that we can help you deliver the programs that your communities and your clients and your end users need the most. Uh, too often, I think what we're finding with HUD is a project went sideways or a project that may have had tremendous merits never got off the ground because they didn't have all the information that we might have been able to bring to the table. You know, we hear about, you know, well, you know, we wanted to do this in our program, but we couldn't figure out how to make it work. Uh, that's, frankly, my office's job is to help you understand and help you identify the resources to deliver those projects that you identified as your biggest priority. Um, our job is to help you get to that ribbon cutting. Our job is to help you get to a yes. Uh, obviously, we've got our regulatory, our statutory boundaries within which, which we must live, but we have an obligation to help you get there because ultimately, the end users are you and your clients. You know, HUD, HUD is not here for HUD's sake. HUD is here, especially community planning and development, is to help communities plan and develop. Sounds oversimplistic, but I think we have, in certain periods in our history, sort of gotten away from that as a core mission. We're really trying to be back there. We're trying to be back there with the place-based initiatives. We're trying to be back there with the partnerships that, that we are expanding. These partnerships never went away with USDA, but I'm not sure we always understood how to leverage one's talents and assets with the other. Uh, you know, we, we very often struggle to understand what is happening out in local communities. So, you know, raise your hand. If you're a nonprofit who's not a direct grantee to HUD, I don't care. I still want that phone call. I, I, would, I cherish the calls of, hey, we're thinking about this. Would you guys have some time to have a 30-minute conference, uh, phone conference about what our idea is and, and maybe give us your thoughts? Absolutely. Uh, you know, my folks, frankly, uh, that's what they miss most uh, is some of the direct project and community contact. Uh, so, so help us deliver that to you. Help us bring those resources back to you. Great, great comment, Taryn. We have a uh, microphone in the back of the room. I think we should probably try to use that for the benefit of our online audience. Uh, Kelly? Yeah. Hi, I'm Kelly Edmiston. Um, I'm from the Kansas City Fed, so uh, sorry to ask the first question okay. from our host. Um, I've already all my colleague and I have uh, argued for about 12 years since I've been here about uh, an issue around rural housing, and that is, um, if I put my economist hat on, then I would think, uh, you know, around whether it's a, a place with a Tyson 
main packing plant or resort area in Colorado that it's, it's not so much that they can't find workers, but they can't find workers at the prevailing wage. And so the expectation then would be that if Tyson wants to get more workers, then if they raise the wage, they could because meatpacking, that's not a very, it's a, it's a tough job, you know, uh, for a lot of reasons. And uh, I'm not sure exactly why that doesn't happen, you know, because, I mean, presumably if the workers were being adequately compensated for having to work in that meat packing plant, then they would be willing to do so. Well, so what the, kind of like yeah. market failures or whatever do you see that are in the way there? Well, my understanding is Tyson has increased the salaries that they're giving, but there is still no infrastructure in that community where people can rent an apartment or even buy a house. There's just, they're out... <coughs> They buy cheap land like anybody else. They try to go where it's cheaper. There's no infrastructure where they're at. And so they're trying to find to reduce their costs, possibly increase their wages. I don't know a lot about their wage structure, but I think they're trying everything. But they told me their biggest barrier is it's not the wages, it's lack of workforce housing. They have no place to rent for people. Should Tyson be the investment? They could. So Tyson could. This is where I think, since they're not a houser, this is a great opportunity to bring a nonprofit to partner with them. They can get the tax credit. Tyson reduces their costs. We can build some workforce housing close to them or home ownership if they want, depending on what they want. But you need somebody to go talk to these businesses. Businesses need somebody who understands a way to reduce their expenditures but help them be successful. So you're not talking housing here. You're talking another type of economics. But you have an opportunity. A lot of folks, a lot of housers don't talk to these companies. They just let them alone. And uh, they won't find the solution if they're not talking to you. So. I, I would also suggest that the issue is not isolated to a certain segment or, or a tier uh, of the income spectrum. Um, you know, yes, meatpacking jobs are, are tough jobs and they're probably not paid enough. I'll never begin to understand the economics of that industry, but the, the issue is not limited to that industry. The state of Colorado right now, uh, in a report out a couple of weeks ago, is facing a, a current deficit of over 1,500 teachers. Okay. Uh, I had a situation last summer where I had six consecutive no thank yous to, a job, to an offer for what I think was a pretty nice federal job of folks who decided and they told me point blank, I can't afford to move to Denver. Uh, so you know, the, this is not a situation where, where it's isolated to Tyson. It, it is across our spectrum and if it's across our spectrum, uh, then that becomes sort of its own self-limiting factor into in who we can be in urban areas and who we can be in rural areas uh, in the future. Yeah. So. There's another opportunity that's here that in Colorado and probably other states, there's the, the State Education Board mm -hmm. owns lots of property <coughs> in the state. Now, what I'd like to do, we did in Colorado, at least in Denver when, when I was here many, many years ago, Denver Public Schools used to sell their property off to build housing because they were trying to attract teachers to get there, or churches. My, my pastor's name was uh, Father Pat. He owned about 10 acres in Denver, and he built housing for his parishioners. He's not a houser, but he had access to a resource that you can use. We have another stars to trying to align. We have the duty to serve right now is being discussed, and this, I want to thank again uh, Senator Corey and uh, Bennett together. This duty to serve, they're supposed to come out with a report here very soon that tells what Fannie and Freddie need to do to invest. Most of these larger companies are doing a lot of investments in urban areas, which I love, but the investment in rural parts is very small. Mm -hmm. Wells Fargo, where's Wells? I met somebody from Wells Fargo here a while ago. There she is. Uh, Wells Fargo received recently an award from us for their investment in home ownership just in rural areas. We have somebody else called First Signature Lending here in Colorado and nine other states doing construction to perm lending just in these states at real affordable, great single close for, that's for home ownership. But we have to find different ways. But this duty to serve opportunity is present now. If we're not encouraging those two large semi-private companies to invest in both urban and rural areas, uh, we're gonna miss an opportunity. And the last one, opportunity I had three, uh, and I'll remember it pretty soon. But the duty to serve is really important. But you need to get some appointments, guys. I can't re-emphasize enough about these appointments. We have a new appointment supposedly for HUD. We don't have one for USDA. USDA will only lend in rural areas. So that's not Westminster, that's not Thornton. It'll be in towns of 35,000 and or less. That's the only place we will invest. For housing, it's 35,000 less. For community development, for community facilities, it's 
20,000. But there's an opportunity for what we've done for multifamily, real quickly. We help finance multifamily construction. Then I came with another program called Computer Facility and built a child care center right next to it. Now, what does an employer need to get jobs? He needs housing, but he also needs child care centers so his people can go to work. The federal government will provide lending right now at two and three eighths for up to 40 years to build child care centers in rural areas of 20,000 or less. But usually we build them close to housing so that people can go right next door, drop their kids off and do something else. So look to USDA or HUD for those multiple programs that come together to build community, not just housing, but talk about workforce housing. I can't emphasize it enough because that's, uh, I'm gonna to talk to other folks that doesn't have, oh, I'll stop, thanks. Ariel, you have a question? Yeah, so this is from the streaming audience. So it was directed at Aaron, but I think it might be appropriate for both Aaron and Tony. So it was uh, in regards to help us, uh, what recommendations do you have for navigating resources at HUD? You mentioned you know, quite a few things, but often it can be daunting uh, for the outside. So Aaron, for you and Tony, if you'd like to add sure. uh, comments as well on navigating resources. We, uh, <laughs> very astute question, we often don't make it easy uh, because if we've got four different programs on the table, we probably have four different sets of regulations and four different sets of compliance requirements, maybe a couple of different flavors of environmental review. Uh, that's why you want us at the table. Uh, that, that, is, that is one of the exact reasons why you want us at the table, to help you navigate to help you align which programs come first, which ones, uh, frankly, are gonna get you the biggest bang for your buck. We are very sympathetic and very understanding that the end users, the developers, especially the nonprofit community, you don't necessarily have the capacity uh, to, to administer all of the different nuances all of our programs. But what we can do is we can work with you to help you deliver that. You know, if you're not a prime grantee, if you're a sub-grantee, so if money's flowing through the state, we can bring our state partners to bear or our municipal partners to bear who are entitlement jurisdictions from cities and other larger grantees. So, you know, to, if, you're, if you're feeling like you're in it alone, please don't. Please, again, that's the reason to invite us to the table of help you structure which of those HUD programs, which of those CPD programs are the best fit and then how best to combine them because where those programs overlap, we very often can help you find efficiencies uh, of application through actual financial administration through back-end compliance. But we have to be at the table uh, in order to help you do that. The way I suggest for both of us, uh, if you don't know who to call in HUD, Call the administrator's office, they'll help you figure out who to call. That way you only have to call one person. If you don't know who to call USDA, you call the state director's office. He or she will then connect you. We have people call the community development specialists. They do housing, multifamily, and community facilities. They do them all. They're not the expert in everything, but their job is to connect you to the right players so you can get the application in. And what Ariel said is so great. You gotta get us both at the table soon because if we're not there at the beginning, what happens, something happens down the road and the application goes haywire and it's too late to fix it. And, and we're not it. I mean, you know, there are other agencies, there's EDA with, with, with economic integrators. There, there are other agencies with community planning and development specialists, you know, even FEMA uh, ha, has, you know, planning and resiliency planning dollars that they're running around the country doing projects and doing planning and doing work out in especially smaller communities. So, you know, it, it's, uh, we, we, are, we are, well, we're the best two federal entities yes. here. Um, <laughs> but other than that, there's more of us. Yes. So. Roger. And you touched briefly on uh, transfer of HAP contracts, the, your 8BB program. Can you talk a little bit more about how that might work? You know, uh, there's two projects within blocks of this building that have opted out, and there's probably 250 uh, units of Section 8 have been lost to the city. H have any projects here had app contracts transferred, or how does the process work? Uh, unfortunately, Roger, I'm not a subject matter expert uh, on, that, on that voucher transfer. There have been several in the metro area. Uh, that have been successfully transferred site to site uh, so that we don't see that net loss uh, in, in that project-based 
but it is a, it's, a, it's a fairly complex transfer that's run through the multifamily group who's administering that. Um, so what I'd like to do is maybe get with you offline and connect you with folks who can walk you through that, especially, frankly, if you see some opportunities for transfer so that we don't realize a net loss. We'd like to, uh, like to get the right people at the table. Beth. I just wanted to comment on that a little bit. And I'm not an expert on it either because it's very <laughs> complicated. Um, but my understanding is that, yes, there have been some transfers of some existing properties in downtown Denver. Um, and it, it depends on the rent level. So, for example, I think there were, as an example, 150 properties lost. I mean, 150 units lost. And they transferred to 80 units because of the rent differences, something like that. But... My understanding is also that two of the transfers were for properties in Denver still, but one was transferred to properties in Grand Junction. So great for Grand Junction, but obviously that's a loss for the Denver area. Um, but that's one of the things that we're trying to work on in our housing preservation network is to identify some of those ABB opportunities. So wanted to share a little bit there. And since I have the mic, <laughs> I know you don't have a crystal ball, Aaron, and there's a lot of uncertainty right now, but what do you think is maybe in the future for the RAD program? I mean, it seems like it has been successful, but it's been fully subscribed, right? Uh, it, it has been. RAD has been fully subscribed, and I would suggest it's been very successful. Uh, yes, I have a crystal ball, but I can give you my perspective, uh, or don't have a crystal ball. Uh, Did you have a question? We're very hopeful that the, the, the demonstration part of the nomenclature is gonna fall off uh, because I think there, there is value. I think that value is, is proving out by the improvement and preservation uh, of these properties. You know, we, we at HUD have to be cognizant of what are we best at and how are we best aligned to deliver end services. Uh, in RAD projects, each of those are individually vetted and a decision is made, you know what? You know, there, there may be a better way to make this happen in the long term. There may be a better way to preserve these units for the people who need them most. Therefore, we are going to take a step back and affect this transfer. Um, I, I'm, I, I expect it will continue. Um, I expect it will no longer be a demonstration project. Uh, you know, that, that type of, of privatization effort uh, has been popular in, in everything from ski mountains in New York to rental projects in Florida. Uh, and, and I think there's value to that. Now, does it, do we need to take some serious lessons learned from the demonstration project and make sure that we affect those transfers properly and that we you know, have the right mechanisms in place to protect that long-term affordability, to protect the units long-term? Absolutely. Um, but I, I expect to see it continue, and I personally would like to see it grow. Ariel. Chris, another one from the streaming. I see we have another question over there. Uh, Tony, uh, this question was directed at you. You basically, When you were covering the number of properties that uh, were losing in rural communities across the country, could you repeat that, please? We're losing approximately 100 to 200 properties <coughs> per year for prepayment and maturing mortgages. And that map that I showed you, it'll list every property that's leaving either because of prepayment, that's possibility, it'll show you this property can prepay, this one, maturing mortgage is coming up. So that's why you can uh, create an opportunity to come together. Now that's 125, 120 properties. How many units are we talking about? With Our that? units usually are smaller than HUD, so the average size is about 25 mm -hmm. to 50 units per property. But we have multiple. That includes farm worker housing, though. I want you to make sure. And in Colorado and other states, farm worker housing is a major provider for workforce housing across the country. Let me, let me show you that. In Maine, we use farm worker housing to have a production for lobsters. If we didn't have farm worker housing, the lobster industry goes to Canada. It is amazing. Workforce housing is important. One more opportunity, real quick. Uh, there's a big discussion about corporate tax cuts coming up right now. One of the major benefits of the corporate tax structure right now is people use low-income housing tax credits as a way to defer their tax liabilities. When they cut the tax credits a lot, if they don't provide some incentives on the tax credit side, we'll be missing an opportunity. We leave 4% tax credits on the table every year in every state. If there's a way to aggregate the 4% to 8%, that's big tax policy changes, guys, and that's not easy to do. 
but everybody wants to do something. So I'd encourage you to really talk to our elected officials, both Bennett and Gardner, because that's where I think it will come out of the Senate side, I believe. But I don't know, Mr. Ryan's pretty good at looking at ways to provide an incentive. So we need some help to make that happen here for our Western states. And believe it or not, we have states in this region that leave 9% competitive tax credits on the, on the table. table. So they should be able to transfer um, those to the states that don't that, have it. That and so makes we'll me take, Chris will take them all. That literally <laughs> makes me shed a tear having been in the Colorado market. We'll, we'll, <laughs> we'll take all of them. There was a question over here. Can you discuss your programs that um, are designed for disabled populations? Ask me? Yes. Yeah, all of you, yeah. anyone. Uh, <laughs> all our properties are made for any customer that can come in. Mm -hmm. And we have a program called a, an NPR program. It's a multifamily preservation renovation program. And usually they have one or two units. Since our properties are very small, 25 units, usually it's one or two units per property. That's what we tend to do. Mm -hmm. But most of our properties were built back in 75 and 1980. These are very small doors. We had less people in wheelchairs back then. So we need a lot of what we call rehab dollars. And a lot of times it's not a tax credit because we only get the 4% in rural areas because the 9% tend to go to the urban areas most of the time, which is okay. So we have to use a program called the NPR program and our 538. We do not have a, a very real strong 538 lender in Colorado right now. It'd be nice to have a 538 in Colorado. That's just the private sector lending. Last year, we get about $150 million every year, which allows us then to do the rehab with a, we defer the first loan, get a 530 in it, get some 4% of tax credits on top of it, and that's how we rent it, renovate it for people with disabilities. But if, we don't have a strong 538 lender in Colorado yet. We have them, but not using a lot. Yeah. And I think our programs really uh, run the entire spectrum from housing authority scale projects where 100% of units are visitable and a certain percentage of units are fully accessible to single family uh, owner occupied rehab uh, where it's handicapped accessibility to keep people in their units, whether they're, they're aging or they've had life conditions change. You know, so, so literally everything from you know, making sure all door widths uh, are of appropriate size in a 100 unit housing authority building through uh, building a, a ramp and kitchen modifications and bathroom modifications in an owner-occupied single family. Um, so it, it, uh, there, there really are no boundaries to that. Uh, you know, through community development block grants, through public facilities dollars, uh, we also make tremendous investments across communities, everything from curb cuts to ramps to make public facilities and bathrooms more accessible. Uh, so. But one way to preserve more properties is to keep people with disabilities and seniors in their current homes. Mm -hmm. We have products and programs that <coughs> help you do that. It's called our 504 Home Repair Program, mm -hmm. which is never used to it complete. We have money left over every year because sure. nobody's applying for the loan. These are mostly loans. You're looking for a grant, we have a few, not many. The grants go quickly. The grants are 7,500 for 62 years and older, income-based. But the loans, we can go up to $20,000, but we're working with Congress, hope to increase that loan and the grant amount to $15,000 for a grant and go up to $30,000, $35,000 on the loan because it costs much more to fix the homes than ever before. And our loans and grants haven't been changed in 20, 25 years. It is amazing. So we need Congress to help there. So you need to educate Congress on the changes to our products and programs and streamline the process in a way. We have time for one more question. Ariel, you've got a... Yeah, I, I've, I've got several actually great, from great. the right. streamers. So one, as far as Tony, you talked about the dashboards. It was one of your slides. How do you, how do you access that, uh, the dashboards? When they get there, uh, uh, I can give you the website. It's a very long one. So I, it's on the, the presentation and a phone number to make sure you get it right because I know I've typed it in wrong too. It should be on the, on the presentation. Okay, so the dashboards. It's, it'll be usda.gov, rd.gov. Okay, very have, good. Find it. That. So it'll be right there. And then, uh, Aaron, another one for you. Uh, folks were interested as far as the numbers of people with vouchers, vets, and others that cannot secure housing. Uh, nationally, any, anything that you can share on that as far as folks I don't that have, have vouchers but can't access housing? Uh, I'm sorry, I don't have those numbers nationally. The best source of that, looking at that from a, a, a local impact perspective, because really the, the sub-markets are so specific, that even to look at that number nationally, I'm not sure would paint an accurate picture. 
but for the submarkets, you really need to go to the issuers. Uh, so, so in in the Denver area, you, you need to be talking to Denver Housing Authority and the Aurora Housing Authority, basically those those voucher holders, because those are the folks that track those literally on a daily basis of what vouchers are utilized, what percent are utilized. Beth, I've heard. Uh, I mentioned a couple of times about money going begging. Mm -hmm. So we certainly don't want that to happen. Um, and as part of our housing preservation network, you know, we have a group of stakeholders, housing nonprofits, uh, both your organizations are in it. Um, so I just want to, maybe I'm just saying this to us so as not to forget it almost, that if we, c if there's some way that I can find out about those things when they come up, then we can get that information out to our, our network so to try and help those resources get utilized. So I don't know if sure. maybe Susan McKittrick in USDA or uh, some of the HUD people, I, I'm just trying to think out what's the best way to get that information to, to me so I can get it out to the network. If you want to talk just strictly multifamily, it's Susan in the floor here. But I would, would not just go to Susan. I would go to the state director's office because they have the whole budget for every program. 504 goes unused most of the time here, not just Colorado, but most states. Um, and multifamily gets used a lot. We just, it's a 538 that we, actually this is the first year we've ever used 538 money a lot. We used $186 million. First time we've ever used 150 and went back and got more to use it because the demand is so high. But if you don't ask, you don't get. So. Beth, I think for, for our shops, the, the best source is the clearinghouse called HUD Exchange. Um, and if you just simply Google HUD Exchange as one word, it'll come up. It's going to give you options where you can subscribe to all those announcements down to the program level. It can be either you know, blanket sort of shotgun funding announcements or topic specific, you know, housing for persons with AIDS or you know, daycare community support, you know, whatever those uh, housing homeless youth if you if you have users and particular constituents that want to drill down into that level of specificity, they can, uh, and then frankly, they will get it as soon as I get it. Um, you know, I I get our announcements internally through the same system. Uh, people are saying, "Well, can't you send it to me sooner?" I said, "No. If I got it at eight this morning, and you were subscribed through HUD Exchange, you also got it at eight this morning. So you know, let's cut out the middleman because my inbox is ugly." So. Yeah, it's a great suggestion. This concept of um, housing preservation is so critical right now with housing prices exploding the way they are and wage, wage growth not keeping up. And the fact that there might be some resources going unused is, is, a, is a bit of a shame. So that, that collaboration and uh, information sharing is a great idea. Uh, to stay on time, I think we'll, we'll uh, cut it off there. I want to thank you all very much for your kind attention. And can we have a round of applause for our speakers, please? Thank you. Nice to see you too. Thanks for letting me talk. For our streaming audience, uh, so we'll be resuming the program at 10:15. Want you to stay connected. Those here in Denver, we're taking a quick break. Thanks.
All right, thanks everybody. Thanks for coming back to our streaming audience. Thank you so much for sticking with us and continuation of the program. Next, I have my colleague Kelly Edmonston, senior economist with the Federal Reserve Bank of Kansas City. He's gonna be talking about new research on rental housing and changes to affordability. So, Kelly. Thanks, Ariel. Um, as always, I'm very happy to uh, um, be in Denver. I've gotten to know a lot of you. Um, and uh, this is a topic in which I've focused, uh, spent a lot of my time recently, and uh, also happy to be able to uh, live stream to other people who, who wouldn't have been able to attend in, uh, in Denver. Um, so again, my topic is uh, um, very clever, of course, uh, the affordability of rental housing. Um, uh, I've been working on a, on a research article, so I've done a lot of research on this particular issue um, over the last few months. Um, it should be out in uh, our economic review, which is our kind of flagship research publication at the Kansas City Fed uh, sometime this month. Um, so uh, look out for that um, if you're interested. Uh, I originally, when I originally wrote the paper, you know, the first couple of drafts, I was using American Community Survey data from 2014 because it was the latest available. Now there's 2015 data up, out, and so I'm kind of updating it. So uh, some of the slides are going to be 2015, some 2014, and in one particular case, that's going to be very important, which, uh, which I'll bring up. So uh, one thing I probably do not need to tell you about is how important, how critical uh, housing is. I mean, for one thing, it's a basic human um, requirement, you know, and has like hierarchy of needs. It's in the bottom, in the bottom of the base, uh, you know, al along with with food and so forth. Um, but housing can be you know, insecure. So housing insecurity is an important issue. When I, when I say insecurity, I mean it's like periodically unavailable, or someone's having to move a lot either because of evictions or not being able to afford it or things of that nature. And uh, that can cause, well, in its extreme, of course, insecure housing leads to homelessness. Um, at the latest count, uh, there are 17.7 homeless people in the United States per 100,000 uh, population. 27% um, of those people are unsheltered. So these are people you might see you know, on the streets or under an overpass and that sort of thing, with the remainder being either in you know, shelters or some kind of transitional uh, housing. Or there are also people who kind of move, some, some people call it couch surfing. You go from house to house and spend a few days there until your welcome is uh, uh, unwelcome. Um, there's, and I don't have to tell you, there's a lot of uh, problems associated with that, not with that go beyond just whether you have shelter or not. Uh, health, uh, poor health is associated with poverty in general, but it's exacerbated with housing insecurity. And another example would be the performance of children in school is significantly affected um, in a negative way by um, housing insecurity. Um, and then it, beyond it being a basic human requirement, Housing is important and affordable housing is important because it makes up such a large share of um, consumers' household budgets. So if paper clips doubled in price, uh, it's not going to have a big impact on people, right, because it would be such a small share of, the, of their household budget. But if something like housing increases substantially, then that, that really is a problem, not only for low and moderate income people, but also for you know, uh, middle income people as well. So uh, I, I seek out in this paper to uh, measure how affordable housing is. I'm looking ac across metropolitan areas. Uh, there's 355 metropolitan areas where I'm looking for uh, information about how affordable or unaffordable housing is there and how that's changed over the last few years. In order to do that, I have to come up with some kind of measure of uh, housing affordability. Um, 
as you all know, uh, a lot, there's kind of a magic number for housing affordability, which is spending 30% uh, or less of your gross income on uh, housing, um, then it might be considered affordable. If you're spending more than that, more than 30%, it's unaffordable. Um, and so even our car cost burden, if it's over 50%, you know, it's extremely cost burden and so forth. And uh, the question of where did that 30% come from? You know, why is it 30%? Well, uh, it's somewhat arbitrary, but at the same time, uh, it does have a basis. Um, the public housing uh, had its uh, um, genesis during the New Deal, um, of course, uh, uh, during the Great Depression. And so there were, there were quite a bit of public housing built. By the 1960s, the, the, these housing projects or developments had started to do deteriorate significantly. And so the response was to raise the rents on the housing so that there would be money available to uh, rehabilitate them and maintain them. Uh, when those rents went up so in the 1960s, uh, not surprisingly, the people who were living there were very upset with the increase and their rents, there were a lot of kind of protests and this sort of thing, and so the decision was made that, yeah, you know, um, this probably isn't gonna be work in terms of a way to be able to maintain these properties. Uh, so what was done was a cap, essentially, was put on rents. Um, and it was done through what's called the Brook Amendment um, to the uh, um, housing uh, policy uh, legislation. And what it said was, that rents couldn't be more than 25% of income. Later in the early 80s, that was increased to 30%. So that's where that came from. But it's still somewhat arbitrary. So I don't use that 30% in any way in my uh, uh, work research. I'm not saying that it's not a good, you have to have a number. I'm not saying that's not a good number. I'm just saying that I think a more general kind of just looking at what we might call affordability index essentially what I'm doing is instead of calling a place affordable or unaffordable, I'm looking at the affordability of one place compared to another or um, and how affordability has changed over time. And I do that through, uh, by the, my affordability index is very simple. It's just rent, annual rent divided by um, annual income. Okay. Um, uh, right now, I've been looking at median income and median household rent. As I'm updating it, right, really right, I mean, I was even working on it last night, I mean, it's what I'm doing exactly right now. Um, I'm gonna look at some lower parts of the income stream, so say uh, people who are at 20, 30, and 40% of the income distribution. Uh, one way the, uh, even though I said I wasn't gonna use it, I'm gonna use it once. Um, one way that the National Low Income Housing um, Coalition has measured affordability using this 30% is uh, to ask, they come up with what they call a housing wage. I know a lot of you have seen this. It's $20.30 currently in the United States or for 2016. And the question is what, uh, at various wages, how many hours would you have to work in order to afford um, a, a, a rental unit at fair market rent. Um, I'm not gonna get into the details of fair market rent. I think most of you are obviously familiar with that too, but basically it's a 40th percentile rent. And the idea behind it is uh, you know, if, you, if you're going to uh, participate in a, um, a federal program, then uh, the housing that's rented has to be um, the 40th percentile is the cutoff. That's what's called the uh, fair market rent. So how much income do you have to need to pay for a rent a unit at fair market rent and not spend more than 30% of your income on housing? So uh, I'm showing data here from 2008 to 2016. It's actually been very steady unless you're looking at fixed wages. So for example, uh, if we look at the minimum wage, which is the blue bar, uh, a person would have to work 112 hours a week in 2016 to afford a house, at, a rental place at fair market rent. Obviously, that's a lot of hours. Um, at uh, a $10 wage, it's 81 hours. At 
even at a $15 wage, and that's what people are kind of clamoring for now, you know, uh, fast food workers and so forth, they'll be strike or, or, or protest or whatever, and uh, they're looking at a $15 minimum wage, that's what they're seeking, but even at that wage, if you wanted to buy a house or rent a house at fair market rent, uh, you would have to work 54 hours. Okay. Um, there are some caveats uh, to this. Um, First of all, uh, there are statutory requirements for overtime pay for non-exempt workers. So workers are making below a certain amount of money. If they work more than 40 hours a week, they have to get time and a half. Um, that was gonna be raised significantly now. It's probably not gonna be. Um, but regardless, so instead of 112 hours, um, if you get overtime, a minimum wage, it would be, you'd still have to work 88 hours. So even if, if we consider the fact that you get paid overtime over 40 hours, it's still like a, a ridiculous amount of work you know, to be able to afford, to be able to afford that. Of course, there's dual learner households, you know, two uh, individuals working full time making 10, 15 an hour would just be able to afford uh, fair market rent at, at 40 hours. And then of course there's some subsidies and, and that sort of thing. But it does go to show you how um, unaffordable uh, rental housing is what's considered kind of a standard decent apartment or, or rental home, how unaffordable that is um, for kind of lower, mo no to moderate income people. This kind of puts it in an in um, interesting perspective. Uh, this is a chart showing rental affordability, or this is basically, um, I'm using that uh, affordability index, which is rent over income, and comparing what's happened to rent since 2005. Okay, so uh, the, um, uh, s the blue line there, that's overall kind of rent, uh, kind of average rent. And uh, you can see the, the green line is kind of what's happened with wages over that same time, and the orange line is inflation. So you can see over time that uh, rent has been increasing faster than wages, and it's been increasing faster than inflation. Um, the red line is multifamily rents. Uh, we have to derive that number. Uh, that number is not published anywhere. Um, but you can see multifamily rents have been uh, rising quite a bit faster. But um, this is a national you know, picture. And what does it mean when you're thinking about rent, a national rent? Uh, as we all know, this is highly localized. I mean, in some sense, that's the point of the paper. But um, what in fact, this uh, overall kind of pattern of increase, pretty consistent increase in rents nationally, that masks a lot of other things that are going on um, across metropolitan areas. This data uses, uh, um, or these measure of rent, this measure of rent is from the consumer price index, the shelter component. Um, and so, you know, part of what makes up consumer prices, that basket of goods that they price to come up with the inflation rate is shelter housing, and specifically shelter. Um, that's kind of a typically used, uh, the most common measure of, of rent um, in kind of research and so forth. Unfortunately, it's only available for 25 metropolitan areas. So that's not near enough to do the kind of analysis uh, that I want to do. So instead, I'm using the, uh, um, rents from the American Community Survey, which is kind of, as you know, it's done annually. I can get annual numbers for metro areas, um, and it's what stuff that used to be in the long form, you know, of the, of the census. So, uh, as you can see, the CPI rent, that's the blue line, what, what I was just kind of showing you in the previous slide, and the American C Community Survey rent, they match up um, pretty well. So, I feel very comfortable using that measure of rent. And the great thing is that I can look at that rent over 355 metropolitan areas. These are the only formulas I'm going to show. Basically, affordability is rent over income. So I'm going to look at that. And then I'm also going to look at how affordability's changed, which is how the percentage change in rent minus the percentage change in income. So affordability kind of in any given time is rent over income. Affordability over time is change in rent minus change in income. Okay, so uh, this slide, it's median gross rent 
you know, in the American Community Survey is a share of median household income. And the point of this is that there's a significant amount of variation across metropolitan areas. Uh, so I'd shown you, um, um, you know, the national uh, rent, but as you can see, there's quite a bit of variation. Uh, the lowest index uh, in terms of rent over income is in Jefferson City, Missouri, um, 13, just over 13 percent. Whereas in Santa Cruz, California, it's almost 35 percent. And so this is at the median. So clearly, a lot of people are rent burdened in Santa Cruz. I put uh, Los Angeles and West Palm Beach down there too. Just Santa Cruz is really kind of a standout. Um, so really, kind of the peak is around 30, um, 30 per, or around 30 percent. Yes. Um, so what I did uh, is I took all 355 MSAs, and what I want to do is I want it's not just that I want to see which ones are least affordable, but look at those sp specific MSAs and try to ask why, you know. Um, so all these dots, each dot represents one of those 355 MSAs. Um, the red ones are the least affordable places. Uh, the blue ones are the highest rent places, and the purple ones are kind of both. They're both high rent and um, very unaffordable. Uh, the high rent places, the, the, the usual suspects, San Francisco, San Jose, New York, um, Los Angeles, um, San Diego, those types of places. Um, but what's interesting here, I think, is that um, uh, a lot of the places that have especially high rents, really high rents, and we've kind of, everybody knows that the rents are very high in San Francisco and New York. They're not necessarily among the least affordable. So it's not as if high rent equals unaffordable. In fact, in places like New York and San Francisco and San Jose, incomes are very high. Median income in San Jose, the, where the Silicon Valley, is about $100,000. So it, it's a lot higher than, than national. Um, and so, in fact, um, if we look at uh, San Francisco, if I were to rank from least affordable to most affordable, is number 64. So there are 63 MSAs that are more affordable than San Francisco. There are uh, 65 or 64 MSAs that are uh, more affordable than San Jose. Uh, and there are 163 MSAs that are more affordable than Washington, D.C. Okay, so this is kind of some really surprising when you look at it, but it's just it really just goes to show that uh, we need to, looking at rent's not enough. We have to look at rent compared to income to, to tell what is affordable. On the reverse side, Yuma, Arizona, um, it's in red. Uh, it's uh, one of the least affordable, the 15 least affordable MSAs in the country. And rent in Yuma, Arizona is less than hundred or less than $1,000 a month. So um, that's kind of the biggest story, I think, if we look at a point in time. Uh, and 2015 in this case. Um, and now if we think about changes, um, this chart shows from the, a positive means that rents increase more than income. And negative numbers mean that, of course, that rent increased less than income. This is all 355 MSAs. And I'm looking at how much that affordability changed over the course of this one is 2010 to 2014. And you can see what how wide the variation is. So uh, you know in the far end, there were places where affordability um, changed by as much as 20%, so they become very much less affordable. Sometimes it's hard to talk about an increase in affordability. Does that mean is it less affordable or more affordable? But in, in this case, the, the numbers on the left-hand side are the ones that became less affordable. What's interesting, the red line there is uh, zero. So um, there were actually um, uh, 150 MSAs that actually saw rent become more affordable over this period. Um, and then uh, uh, only about, there were about 90 MSAs that had um, where it was 5%, the change rent grew five percentage points faster than income. So quite a bit of variation there. Um, even if, as we're lamenting rents, I mean, obviously, uh, in some places, 
it has changed a lot and rent is very unaffordable. And even within a specific metro, there are certain segments of the population where it's very unaffordable or um, um, certain parts of the MSA. So this isn't, even at the MSA level, this isn't the whole picture. But what, again, this just goes to show that the variation is very significant, that these national numbers really don't um, mean as much. Uh, don't mean a whole lot. This is, I, I don't have much time because I want to make sure we have questions, but this is a, the change in affordability. And so anything to the uh, northwest of that 45 degree line means it became less affordable. And if it's a, to the southeast, it means it became uh, more affordable. So there are a significant number of MSAs that became more affordable. Um, in terms, I'm obviously I'm going to go into detail on all these specific MSAs, but I'll tell you what the main things I uh, get from this. First of all, what you'll find is that uh, if you have a military base, especially if you're a smaller MSA, that's really important recently. In fact, um, uh, those places have become less affordable. Um, and it, it's amazing how many, if I look at the top 15, 20, 30 MSAs in terms of becoming less affordable, how many of those have major military bases. Um, and on the military bases, it's not so much an increase in rent as a decrease in median income. And a lot of that has to do with base realignments and, and that troop movements and that sort of thing. I talk about that in the paper. Um, if I look at through 2014, uh, a big factor is if you're an oil or energy town, Odessa, Texas, Midland, Texas, um, the parts of Louisiana, uh, these places saw huge increases in rent. Um, as the old people were moving in to work in the oil patches or what have you. So 2010 to 2014, you can see Odessa, Texas way up there. Um, and then the uh, um, home of Bayou, uh, Thibodeau, Louisiana. Um, those are examples of oil boom places where rents rose very quickly. And, and they did so relative to, uh, to income. The um, Tipperary, Louisiana, it's so much, somewhat unusual because they had the deep rise in oil spill. That's where the oil spill occurred. Um, but I, I talk about these kind of the, the, the um, role of energy also. What's interesting, if I look at 2000, this is through 2014, if I look through 2015, we don't see the oil at energy places there anymore and the, those becoming least affordable. And that's not surprising. Mid-2014, the oil price started plummeting, recounts went down, and so on and so forth. What we see in 2015, which I don't show up here, is all of a sudden a lot of university towns are appearing. So we're talking about places like, like Manhattan, Kansas, where Kansas State is, um, Harrisonburg, Virginia, where um, uh, James Madison University is, and uh, Morgantown, West Virginia, where the University of West Virginia is. So that's... There, you look at one year difference in, in, in the story, the story changes. And then finally, there's the usual suspects, you know, population changes and that sort of thing. Um, I'm, I'm sure this presentation will be made available or you can email me for it, but these show uh, in blue the uh, uh, military towns and in gray and black the um, uh, oil boom towns. And you can kind of see how that plays out in terms of rent growth. Um, conclusions, um, you, nationally, yeah, rents have grown relative to inflation, relative to earnings. That doesn't tell us a whole lot. Because um, we, we really look at, need to look at the MSA level. And really, even within the MSA, within Denver, the rent, the affordability of rent can be very different in one part of Denver versus another. Um, first, and others, the high rent MSAs, are not necessarily unaffordable can relative to other places. And also low rent MSAs aren't necessarily affordable. So I think that's something we definitely need to keep in mind. So uh, for, again, San Francisco, San Jose, New York, people talk about that all the time. The rents certainly are very high, but so are incomes. Um, and then you know, there's a lot of kind of idiosyncratic reasons why some places have become much less affordable. And that might be energy intensity um, or, um, uh, you know, military or university town or something of that nature. So we can kind of put that together to tell a story. Um, there's my contact information, you know, if you want to 
you're welcome to contact me and talk a little more about this. And uh, so I'll turn it over for, for questions. Will you guys join me in thanking Kelly for his presentation, please? So questions from the audience, and if you can, hands up, and I do have some from streamers. Uh, basically, has this paper been released, or if, if not, what uh, kind of the time frame in regards to the release of this paper? Uh, we're, I can't give you a guaranteed date, but uh, we're looking at, because uh, there are a lot of people involved in publishing paper, but um, we're looking to get it in uh, out in December. Okay, and then on one of the slides you had, Another one, Gene. Uh, EC, e, e, EC, oh. EC wage uh, chart five, and what does that? Say? Yeah, so uh, uh, my, when I was like, when we were looking at the chart, I referred it generally as to earnings. EC, EC stands for employer cost for employer compensation, and it's done by surveys, companies survey. And uh, in this particular case, I, I looked at the wage component, but there's other farms. Other parts of employee compensation also, for example, retirement contributions or health insurance. So basically, it's just what I think is a good measure of earnings for this particular type of analysis. Question uh, again from uh, Scream. For those MSAs that have become more affordable, what can you attribute to that trend? And what is happening in those MSAs to help affordability? So, um, it's kind of a, um, it's very, the, the easy part is plotting all these out and calculating affordability. The hard part, of course, is trying to figure out why these are uh, the way they are. A lot of it is kind of the usual suspects where um, maybe populations are growing fast, especially non-organic population growth. Like, um, for example, in Denver, um, there's a lot of population growth due to immigration. Um, the local housing market, so there's a um, kind of rent or own, uh, the rent and the price of owner-occupied housing, they're related to each other. So uh, some housing markets that uh, didn't fare so well um, during the uh, um, housing crisis, in some cases, not all cases, because there's a lot of different factors to play, but in some cases, uh, we saw rent move higher uh, earlier in those places as people moved out of owner-occupied housing um, into rental. Um, and, and even um, yeah, how expensive it is to build in these places, there are a number of different factors. Yeah, I'm pointing out, like, um, um, I'm trying to think the more affordable. Um, but I haven't, it's not, I haven't nailed it down like these things like military bases and, and university towns and so forth as much as I have on the high side. That's something I should probably look into a little more carefully. I've kind of been focused on um, places becoming less affordable, but clearly looking at places that are becoming more affordable can give us a lot of interesting insights in terms of what, what kind of policy uh, policies are working or need to work. Um, it could be policy, but it could be something else going on. We need, we do need to identify what that is. So uh, that was a very good question, and something that's like a, yeah, I can look into uh, further. Checking in the room for questions. Okay. Microphones coming your way. You started out by talking about. Uh, using a certain income just to look nationally, whether it was median or, or uh, whatever criteria, but then you, you s alluded to the fact that you might look at populations or incomes that were maybe in a more vulnerable area that wasn't the median. Um, is that, are those considerations going to be in this paper or is that something that you might do uh, as another? Uh, they'll be in this paper. Okay. Um, I'm literally working on that right now. So, um, yeah, I'm going to look at, um, it's a little more difficult because to the census I can't get kind of percentage points. You know, the median obviously is 50, fair market rent is 40. So I'm using data from the current population survey, which is where they get unemployment, where they derive the unemployment rate and things like that, and setting up brackets and trying to place those families. So. Um, 
what the the way I'm going to present that is basically you know, looking at this. You had this uh, slide, this chart with change in affordability, and then what that looks like for people with income at the 20th, 30th, 40th, 50th percentile, for example. Have another question from a streamer. Uh, <laughs> okay, one was tongue in cheek. Can you share more calculations? <laughs> All right. So I guess that will be in the paper. But I just can actually. Yeah. <laughs> and so just a reminder to folks that are streaming and also to the audience, we will have uh, uh, PDFs of all of the web, all of the PowerPoints uh, on our website, so you will have access to those. And uh, with that, will you guys join me in thanking Kelly for his presentation, please? And with that, I'd like to invite the next panel, Katie McKenna, who's Community Development uh, Officer for Habitat for Humanity, and the panel on preservation trends. Beat me to it. Hello, thank you, Ariel. Um, I'm Katie McKenna. I'm the Director of Community Development at Habitat for Humanity of Metro Denver. I'm excited to be here with Beth and Ravi to talk about <coughs> trends in preserving affordable rental housing and nat naturally occurring affordable housing. But before we get into that, um, I'm going to talk a little bit about Habitat for Humanity. Habitat has been working in the Metro Denver area for 37 years to build and preserve affordable housing. And we operate in the home ownership space. So I know we're talking about affordable rental housing here today, but as Tony pointed out this morning, the conversation about rental housing and home ownership opportunities really needs to be connected because of that exit strategy idea. If someone is living in subsidized affordable rental housing, they need a path to move on beyond that. Now, not everyone will always be able to, but some people do need and want that opportunity to move from an affordable rental into an affordable home ownership opportunity. At Habitat for Humanity, we work to provide that affordable home ownership opportunity. Um, so that's one side of it. Another side of it is um, to prevent or delay the re-entry from a home ownership, an affordable home ownership uh, situation back into a subsidized affordable rental. Um, so that's what I'm going to spend the most time talking about uh, today. So Habitat for Humanity, we in Denver work in the five county metro area. We um, build and, and preserve home ownership opportunities for people who want to buy houses. We also have a home repair program that is our largest growing program and it's our key preservation strategy to help uh, low-income homeowners who do own their home but may need, uh, afford, may need critical home repairs done to their home so that they can stay in that home and it can continue to be an affordable home for them long into the future. Uh, most of our preservation work is focused in the Globe Valeria and Swansea neighborhoods, nor in neighborhoods in Northeast Denver, for those of you who aren't in Colorado. Um, these, neighborhoods, these neighborhoods in Denver uh, have a lot of often negative things associated with them, highway traffic, pollution, uh, smelters in years past, marijuana grow houses today, but there's also a lot of positive things in these neighborhoods, and one of them is naturally occurring affordable housing. So the houses, the housing that's in Globe Valeria and Swansea is affordable without subsidy. And there's a higher rate of home ownership in these neighborhoods than there is throughout the rest of the metro area. And at Habitat for Humanity, we think it's really important to be able to um, maintain the fabric of these communities by helping low-income homeowners be able to stay in these affordable houses. Um, so one family in particular uh, comes, to my, comes to mind, uh, Habitat worked with this family, Norberta and Serafin, earlier this year, and they um, have a very low income, but they've paid off their house. They purchased their house 24 years ago, 
for about $30,000 in the Swansea neighborhood. They have three generations and eight people living in this house. So it's a really important um, house, not only for the structure of their family, but also um, there are a lot of people who are living in this house. If they're not able to continue living here, what will the, what will the solution be for this family? So um, when, when we first met with them, we kind of do an assessment of the full, the full property. And the biggest, most urgent need that was coming to the front was when it rained outside, it rained in their kitchen. Um, so obviously, this is not a manageable, a manageable living situation for this family. But it's also, it was really challenging for them because they don't have the upfront money to be able to pay to replace their roof. That's what needed to happen. And the longer that they defer this repair, the worse it gets and the more expensive it's going to be. So either they figure out how to replace their roof or eventually they'll likely need to sell their house and move to other housing. Their combined household income was about $30,000 and we all know, um, and it's very stark in our mind thanks to Kelly, um, $30,000 you can't afford to rent or buy anything in Denver that's not subsidized. So the options in front of us are replace a roof, that costs us about $6,000, or have a family lose their affordable housing, need to move into a subsidized rental situation, or out of the metro area. Um, so the ability to be able to preserve that home ownership unit connects very strongly with um, the affordable rental conversation because not only do we need an exit strategy for people to come out of affordable rentals, we need to come up with strategies to make sure that they're not funneling back in because they don't have the tools that they need to be able to stay in their houses and in their communities. Um, so that's the, the main goal of Habitat's home repair program and our preservation work. Um, so with that, we are going to switch to going back to talking about affordable rental housing. Um, I'm so glad to have both Beth and Ravi here today. Um, they are both experts in affordable housing and I often think of um, the, the saying it takes a village to raise a child. It also certainly takes a village to solve an affordable housing crisis and all of the pieces of this conversation are so important and we all bring unique and important tools to this work and coming together like this today to have a conversation, a holistic conversation to really come up with these creative solutions is so important for us to be here doing that. Um, so I'll, I will turn it over. Um, we have Beth Truby, who is the preservation program manager from Chaffa, and Ravi, who is the founder and CEO of ICAST, who are going to talk to us um, about the work that they're doing to preserve affordable rental housing and with naturally occurring affordable housing in our area. Okay. Thank you, Katie. I know Habitat Metro Denver is doing a lot of good work um, developing new affordable housing and preserving uh, affordable home ownership opportunities. And thank you, Ariel and the Federal Reserve for hosting this great event today. Um, let's see. Whoops, went the wrong way. Um, Kelly shared with us a lot of great statistics. I wanted to just set the stage a little bit more with just, just a few more. Um, we all know rental housing is an important component of uh, the a good, healthy housing mix. And typically about a third of the population has been renters. But we've got about 36% of the population that are living in rental housing right now, and that's the largest share that we've had since the late, 1960s, late 1960s. In addition to that, the number of renters has increased by nine million over the last decade. That's the largest 10-year gain on record. And these increases are in all income levels, all age groups, all household types. You can see from 2003 to 2013, the number of low-income households, uh, low-income renter households, that rose 40% also. Um, so that really surged over that time period. 
Multifamily housing starts are, have rebounded a lot from the 2009-2010 uh, difficulties that we experienced. But these new units, they're primarily, we are all pretty aware that they're being built for the highest, primarily for higher income renters. So asking rents are going up, but median renter incomes are going down. So what kind of inventory is there for people of more modest means? Um, there's about 11 and a half million units of affordable housing stock. So you can see that includes um, these federally assisted units, primarily HUD, USDA units that uh, Tony talked about this morning. Those are primarily um, projects that a lot of those, as Tony again mentioned earlier, they were done in the 60s, the 70s, to the mid 80s. They uh, have received some kind of subsidy from the federal government or sometimes local governments, um, either interest rate subsidies, rent subsidies, below market interest rate. Um, there are these 2.7, whoops, 2.78 million low-income housing tax credit units that were placed in service from uh, about 1987 to 2014. And we also have the 1.2 million public housing units owned by housing authorities uh, across the country. And then, of course, I won't press the wrong button this time, these 5.5 million unsubsidized but affordable rental units. Um, so you can see that's uh, the largest share of this stock. So what is happening with that affordable, uh, the subsidized affordable housing stock? Well, the construction rates for the subsidized housing, they've declined from that mid-1970s high of around 300,000 units to more in the neighborhood of 75,000 to 100,000 units today. And again, Tony mentioned that this morning, how many USDA units are being lost all the time. Uh, HUD units are the same, unsubsidized units. For every new affordable apartment created, it's estimated that two are being lost. So we're losing ground. Um, the affordable use periods for about 2.2 million, but privately owned, but federally assisted units are going to end between 2015 and 2025. Um, the, so the new stock is unaffordable. We're not building enough new subsidized housing, and the supply of existing sub subsidized housing is decreasing. In Colorado, as an example, we have about 1,275 multifamily properties that have some kind of rent restriction uh, for affordability periods on them, and about 65,000 subsidized units. So it's a pretty large number. So why are we losing these units? Well. The, we know that Denver, ha Denver, Colorado, a lot of places have uh, pretty robust real estate markets. Um, so when a property owner who owns a subsidized property, their units are, the affordability periods are coming up for expiration. Well, there's a lot of uh, incentive for that owner to opt out and convert those properties to market rate. They're renting at below market rates now in all likelihood, and so the owner may want to opt out uh, to convert to market rates. Um, owners of properties in weak housing markets, they may not earn enough uh, income to support and maintain the property, and they may be deteriorating and neglected. And uh, again, as Tony mentioned this morning, a lot of these owners, some of these owners who did properties in the 70s and 80s, a lot of them have one or two or a few uh, properties in their portfolio. They're nearing a time when they don't want to deal with uh, being a landlord anymore. So owners may lose interest and or not have the capacity to want to recapitalize these properties. So what is preservation? Um, given all these demands that we've seen on housing and all the pressures that may be out there to convert to market rate, uh, preservation really is just taking action to ensure that that federal subsidy and the low income restrictions remain in place and preserve that long term affordability of that unit. And as we said, a lot of times these properties are aging, they need new capital, um, they need to be upgraded. So so 
a lot of times there needs to be new capital needs to be raised and repair the property. And we may want to look at transferring the property to uh, someone, if we can, who has interest in continuing those affordability restrictions if the owner is wanting to exit the program or exit um, being a manager and owner of low-income units. So what are the benefits of preservation? Well, it's cost effective. It tends to cost to a half to two thirds uh, less than new construction. Of course, you can upgrade the energy efficiency, the resource efficiency of that project at the same time, making a lot of savings for the property, for the owner, and uh, keeping it affordable. It's easier than new construction. The entitlement process is complete. We don't have to rezone. We don't have, need new land. We don't need new infrastructure. Uh, so some of those NIMBY issues may not be present with a preservation project. And we want to also maintain and support that public investment that we've made in those properties up to, up to this time. So they've received that public support, and they really are critical community ac uh, assets. And in addition, uh, gentrification, involuntary displacement, these issues are happening in a lot of our neighborhoods, and preservation can be a great tool for helping mitigate the effects of gentrification and keeping uh, families and communities more stable, more diverse, more healthy. So there's a lot of benefits to preservation. So, recognizing this challenge, uh, a group of organizations got together to uh, discuss what can we do about this. There was a recognition that units were being lost. I mean, uh, in, you intuitively know this, but um, there was uncertainty regarding what that inventory was in Colorado, and uh, we need, felt like we needed more information to start to tackle the problem. There was no coordinated strategy in place to try and tackle the problem once we <laughs> understood it. Uh, so the need was there to come up with some kind of coordinated strategy. And um, the recognition also that this hot real estate market that we're in, it's certainly making preservation more difficult all the time. So the core preservation working group was established with key stakeholders. And so uh, the housing preservation network was formed. Uh, currently, there's a lot of groups in the network. So Chaffa is, of course, a major player in this. HUD has been a great partner. The State Division of Housing is involved. Uh, there's multiple public housing authorities, local jurisdictions, the City of Denver, Colorado Springs, um, Aurora, Golden, and some others. There's a variety of housing nonprofits involved, including developers and owners of some of these preservation properties. Um, it was also felt like felt that it would be beneficial to hire a point person. So, a uh, preservation program manager position was created at Chaffa, and I was fortunate to be uh, selected to fill that role. Um, working with the advisory group, working with all these stakeholders to try and really focus and define and implement a strategy about preservation. So, it was also felt that a database to help us get a handle on what the inventory was and the characteristics of that inventory so that we can really craft some strategies was critical and help us to aid in identifying um, those really truly at-risk properties. So uh, we've developed a, a statewide strategy for preserving housing units throughout Colorado and we're in the middle of implementing that right now. So these are the key components of the strategic plan, uh, and it's focused in these primary areas. Of course, the preservation of units, that's goal number one, but we've got a lot of initiatives in these different areas that we're also working on. Um, the creating the preservation catalog was considered critical, and we'll talk about that in a second. Um, also, targeting resources. We all know resources are limited. Tax credits aren't going begging in Colorado. So trying to prioritize properties to be able to target those resources better, better that's a critical component. Maximizing the available resources that we have for preservation, and I think we're going to, uh, speaker will talk a little bit more about that later, um, another speaker. And um, 
engaging with property owners and stakeholders about preservation, and also sharing uh, policy and best policies and best practices that can be used for preservation. So I want to talk a little bit about the database because it's really been critical. I mean, it is the platform that we can use to target our decision making, and it's really acting as an early warning system for us. Um, of course, multiple agencies restrict properties when they provide some kind of subsidy or support to that property. So everyone, they had different fields. Of course, they have different programs and formats for that. So that definitely took a lot of work to establish those standard reporting fields, reporting protocols, and aggregating that data from multiple sources. And we, I mean, everybody really worked <laughs> for a long time to do that and brought all that data together and it's really becoming a very useful tool for us. So we can map the inventory of affordable units, we can track them, analyze them, um, and all the housing uh, preservation network partners have access to that, whether they're a restricting entity or not. And so it lets us have greater collaboration, we can really focus on our priorities, and really be proactive instead of reactive. So what, what is it showing right now? The database, as we said, there's about 1,275 multifamily properties, about 65,000, over 65,000 subsidized units in those properties. You can see uh, the year of the expiration, the sources of restrictions, the, there's property and owner information on there. Does it, is it uh, elderly for senior units? Um, are they special population units? We're adding uh, area median incomes to the database, the number of bedrooms, and we're gonna be linking it a new um, upgrade that the, data team is working on is to link all those properties to community profiles so we can see what the market conditions and some of the other uh, job growth, things like that, conditions are for each property and pull up that information. So that's really a great upgrade that uh, is being worked on now. So 150 properties have been identified that all the restrictions are expiring in the next 150 years. Uh, uh. Oh my God, we've got plenty of time. Uh, 150 properties in the next three years. <laughs> and about 5,900 subsidized units in that. So those units are expiring. We either need to keep them affordable or we need to replace them, uh, one of the two. So <clears throat> I wanted to show you a little bit what the database looks like. You can see here, this is a map of the state. And you can see while um, a majority are, you can see they're clustered along the front range, of course, about 54% are in the Metro Denver area. But you can also see they really are distributed throughout the state. So this resource is, is statewide and we need to maintain it. Um, each of the properties are color-coded, for example. Um, this is the full list. You can see, uh, you can pick the number of years that you go out. You can pick the, what restrictions you want. If you just want to look at certain restrictions, here's the expiration type, um, whether it's a Section 8 or it's got LIHTC in it or it's got a local government restriction or a state of uh, Colorado restriction. That's all in there. So there's really multiple ways to display the information and you can see down at the bottom uh, it lists the properties this is just the first one but it will list the properties that are in that certain data set so it's a, a really good tool here's another page where just the section eights are called out for the next three years so this is the properties that have section eight restrictions that are going to be expiring in the next three years and again the properties on the bottom you can see what's in and you can scroll down and see those properties uh, the, the rest of the properties and then you can export that data out and work with it so it's really handy and then finally um, you can pull up details of a specific uh, property and you can see a lot of them do have multiple restrictions on them. So we can see that, and then again, that really helps the partners work together on those. So uh, just wanted to share a little bit more detail on the strategic plan. Of course, we're really working on engaging with owners and other uh, stakeholders 
in uh, trying to preserve these properties and providing technical assistance to owners. We're starting a survey of owners right now to, we're starting with those 150 uh, properties that are expiring, everything is expiring in the next three years. And we're uh, surveying them on what are their plans? Do, are they thinking of opting out? Do they want to sell? What kind of assistance do they need to stay in the program? So that'll help us fine tune what kind of resources we may be able to bring to that project or what we can do to assist that project uh, stay uh, affordable. And we'll be developing an owner toolkit to share with owners. Uh, it'll have information on resources, uh, a lot of the HUD preservation programs that Aaron mentioned this morning, we're gonna have that in there. Um, and other, other kind of tools that may be uh, of, useful, uh, of use and of interest to them. In policy development, we're looking at some of the best practices out there. Um, and sharing those, wanting to share those with jurisdictions throughout the state or having happy to share that anywhere, of course. Some of the uh, things that we're looking at, preservation ordinances, for example. The city of Denver has a preservation ordinance, but many uh, states and local jurisdictions do have preservation ordinances that include right of first refusal. So uh, typically notice has to be given to if an owner wants to opt out of a subsidy program and is gonna sell the property, they have to give notice to that governmental entity and the tenants, uh, typically. And then there's the option for the right of first refusal that can be assigned to maybe a governmental entity or a qualified nonprofit. Even in uh, some cases, tenant organizations, tenant associations have that right to purchase and then they can assign it to a nonprofit who maybe has the ability to actually uh, purchase that property. So sharing, pulling the information on best practices from them, uh, about them, and sharing those statewide. We're also gonna be having information on tax incentives. Right now in Colorado, there is such a thing called the economically derived market adjustment, where affordable properties, if, they have, if they're deed restricted, they can have lower values, lower property tax values. A uh, lot of deed restricted owners don't even know about that, so we would wanna get that information out as an example in the owner toolkit. And, um, but other, other jurisdictions do do a little bit more with tax incentives. For example, they may uh, give you an exemption for the cost of improvements to affordable units. Some of you may have heard of the Apartment Association of Metro Denver, their program that they've been talking about recently where the owners would receive a cash payment for keeping an apartment uh, affordable so for a certain period of time. So those are the kind of things we wanna pull into the best practices and share. Uh, resources, of course we want to maximize uh, resources and one program I wanted to call out specifically is this CPACE pilot program. Commercial PACE is uh, pretty new in Colorado. It can be, it's been authorized by the state, but it has to then be authorized by each county. I think there's about seven or eight counties that have authorized it so far, including several metro area counties, but also Pitkin and Eagle and some others. Um, with commercial PACE, you can fund the energy efficiency improvements through, uh, you get a loan, but then it's, the payback is on your property tax bill. So you can pay it off up to 20 years, in an up to 20 year term. And then when the property is sold, it goes with the property. So again, as I said, it's paid back on your property tax bill. Even if you're, say, a nonprofit and you may not pay taxes, you can still fund that program and uh, fund those improvements and put it on your property tax bill. So we're looking at a pilot program right now. We're, we're gonna be selecting up to three properties, probably older properties that um, will get more, will benefit more from the energy efficiency improvements to their building. Uh, so we're looking at doing that right now and documenting the benefit of doing those uh, commercial pace program on your property. I wanted to mention the priority preservation properties as well. Um, we are looking, I mean, we've identified those properties that are expiring soon in the next three years, but with limited resources, we wanna be able to target what resources we have better. So 
the priority preservation properties, we're developing kind of a risk analysis matrix where we're looking in more detail at uh, some of the characteristics of these properties. And they might be, have a higher or lower priority where they fall on this um, risk analysis matrix. Things like if it's got a larger number of units, if the building has over, the property has over 100 units, we might be more interested in that. If it um, deals with, if it houses special populations, that might be something we're more interested in preserving. If it, um, it targets extremely low income populations, again, we might be more interested in that. And also looking at opportunity areas. So if it's a property that's in a job growth area or has um, uh, better education there, things like that, those are the kind of things that might affect how high a priority it, uh, is for the group in targeting resources there. Um, so that's one we're working on right now. Finally, I wanted to end a little bit with the naturally occurring affordable housing. Uh, a lot of times preservation programs, uh, they focus on subsidized housing because it's, it can be easier to work with subsidized properties than uh, just the general properties out there. We know, even though it took some time to figure out the inventory, it was still easier to figure that out than all the naturally occurring affordable property out there. Um, and a lot of times, the subsidized properties, they provide really deep subsidies that are helping extremely low-income people. So you do want to support that public investment. But we saw in the earlier slide, the really the big opportunity is in naturally occurring affordable housing or unsubsidized affordable housing. So we really feel like that has to have a place in our strategy. What are those? They're typically B and C properties, so they're older, no frills. Um, there, I've seen estimates, they're 36% of all rental units, and because they are a little bit smaller properties a lot of the time, 76% of all multifamily properties. The rents there are much more affordable, but they tend to have low vacancy rates and be solid investments. They have good rental growth, but they're low volatility when markets change. I mean, they're stable investments for owners, and they can be stable living situations for the um, people who live there. So we really would be looking to support mission-driven purchasers in those opportunity areas particularly and of course uh, for the naturally occurring affordable housing and for our preservation or subsidized properties really we're working to have ready capital because if we need to compete in the market we're gonna have to be able to move quickly on these so that's another piece that we're uh, working on so it's a statewide effort and we're happy to talk with anybody and uh, work with you and share information anytime, so thank you. And I think before we go to questions, we'll have Ravi talk about his work at ICAST in the preservation space. Aurel, thanks for having me here and thank you all for joining us. Uh, I'm not gonna talk much about our work in the preservation, more so around policy issues and what all can we do? Uh, we've heard enough times right, that preservation is uh, much more affordable or cheaper than uh, building new, and we keep losing 2x the amount that we are building, and so the problem is of preservation or, or affordability is growing on us, and uh, I think we all agree we can't build our way out of it, so what is it that we can do? And I'm gonna try and tackle that issue. So just a little bit about us, we're a small nonprofit. Uh, we work in the affordable housing space, but we also work in the clean energy space, and we also work in the community development space, and in the climate change space, so there you go. Uh, we do look at portfolios, look at properties, we can do property assessments, et cetera, to figure out what the property needs in terms of getting rehabbed and um, improved. Uh, we do the ac actual rehab and retrofits, we have a small CDFI where we provide access to financing for that rehab. Uh, we specialize in PACE and energy performance contracts and pay for success and those kinds of financing mecha mechanisms. Uh, we do staff training on these new uh, high efficiency systems that we might install and tenant engagement on site and online. So we're trying to create this turnkey model in terms of doing preservation work. So. 
that's us. Our CDFI is a better building challenge partner, again, focused on affordable multifamily prop properties, and then we're a Texas space financer. So market need, I think we've all heard this one, right? And we've all seen those numbers. I'm not gonna dwell on the numbers. The point is there's a shortage of res residential units and rental units, and especially so in the very low income categories. So we're all aware of that. Right? There's enough data that's been shared this morning, right? How many people are rental population in Colorado? How many of them are cost burdened? All of that. And so the takeaway for me is, right, the low income population is cost burdened and the situation is going to get worse because all of the data that was shared was from 2010 census and those living in the Metro Denver area are aware that prices have gone up drastically since 2010 in the last six years. So the situation has only gotten worse, right? And we also are aware that most of these properties are old. The average age of any building in the U.S. is 36. The average pr property is 40 year olds when it comes to a multifamily rental property. So we're talking old properties and you heard USDA mention the fact, right? 70s and 80s stock. Uh, that's not uncommon. That's pretty much across the board, no matter where you live in this country. So it's a losing battle. There's enough data points, enough people have said, right? We're, we can't build our way out of this. Uh, and at this point, right, subsidized housing, which is what we keep talking about, is the only affordable option for low-income households. Uh, and soon, I think the moderate income folks, if not already, and especially in the Denver metro area, are facing the same dilemma, that they're paying more than 30% or maybe 50% of their income on rent. So what's the solution? And it's not moving them out to Lyman, uh, right? as we sometimes think. Because uh, affordability is not only rent, in our minds it's rent plus transportation plus utilities plus health. Uh, inefficient homes, unhealthy homes, bad indoor air quality. There's enough data showing it impacts health and healthcare costs. So what can we do to preserve this housing? Right? And I'm gonna make three points through the presentation that fixing existing housing is a heck of a lot cheaper than building new ones. Acquiring these naturally affordable properties before they look, get out of the market. Uh, you know, it's anecdotal evidence, but every last three or four CREJ conference, CREJ stands for the Colorado Real Estate Journal conference I go to on multifamily, there's a panel of about six developers, most of them are out of town. There's a data point, I think, for Colorado, which says 75% of the acquisitions of multifamily properties in the last four years have been from outside money, so from the East Coast or West Coast. And so I have this uh, six panelists sitting there, and each one of them has acquired 15, 20, 25 properties in the last three years, and they are called value-added developers. Basically, they're putting lipstick on the pig and putting it out for more rent. Uh, that's common what's happening not only in Denver but other places, right? And so we keep losing these naturally affordable properties to uh, developers who are value-added in the sense that they fix it up and put it out for a lot more rent. And then green retrofits, which is kind of what we do, is probably the cheapest way to help preserve affordable housing because one thing you can help control is that utility bill, which is part of the affordability. So I'm gonna try and help make the case for those. So bear with me, a lot of numbers are coming out. So in terms of benefits of the green retrofit, most of you are aware of it, but if not, right, it helps increase the value of the property, it reduces operating costs, it reduces the cost of obviously the utilities. Uh, it lowers mortgage payment. There's enough incentives out there, like FHA came out with their MIP reduction, so you can get almost 40 basis points off your mortgage if you can prove yourself to be a green property, and you get 85% loan to value versus 80, so you can get more money if you can do that. So there's a lot of benefits for the owners to do that, and from the resident's perspective, the benefits in terms of lower utility bills, lower healthcare costs, 
and a more comfortable, safer place, right? Once you rehab the property, especially do green improvements, you know, you stopped that draft, those hot and cold zones, it's a just more comfortable property, you've taken care of indoor air quality issues, uh, you have better lighting and those kinds of things. So there's ancillary benefits beyond just utility cost reduction. Uh -oh. There we go. So why there is a need for green rehab? Some data points. Uh, Low-income households typically spend four times the percentage of income than an average US household. The same applies for healthcare costs. So it's a double whammy. They make less money and then they live in inefficient homes. Right? Uh, a lot of these rental properties are really old. We talked about that. Uh, the subsidy from HUD last year in energy subsidies was about four billion. So that's a big chunk of change. Uh, just in Colorado, there's $44 million being paid in utility bill payment assistance. Now all of these subsidies, whether it's utility bill payment assistance or these energy subsidies, that's a one-way ticket, right? You're spending that subsidy, you're not causing any impact on the root cause of the problem. You're not fixing the house. Uh, that subsidy only goes up because energy costs go up, people are in need of more subsidies, so that's a never-ending problem. All you're doing is subsidizing the utility companies and helping them recover their costs. Uh, there's, there's no solution if you keep doing that, right? And so the question is, can we invest those subsidies instead into green improvements and fix the problem so there is no need for those subsidies through various mechanisms, whether such as pay for success? So here's a table basically that shows, as expected, that the affordable housing properties perform much worse when it comes to energy efficiency, their energy use intensity as a measure of energy spending or utility spending is much worse than market rate properties. And multifamily properties don't do too well anyways when it comes to as compared with even single family homes or other homes. So there's a huge opportunity to fix these properties and reduce the utility bill once and for all, and hence reduce the subsidy. So I took a case study. This is Rifle Housing Authority. It really doesn't matter which one it is. It's a very generic case study, how much money was spent. right? For that $250,000 investment, there's about $30,000 of savings to be had. right? So, And I picked this example to make the point that that $250,000 investment in Denver kind of gets you one new apartment built or perhaps a lot more retrofitted apartments. If you acquire and retro rehab, it could be much more. Or it could save you $450,000 in subsidy over the 15-year life of that green upgrade. And so the way that works is, if you think about it, right, those windows last for a long time if you change them out. Uh, the solar panels last 25 years. HVAC systems last 25, 30 years. Uh, insulation loss for a long time. So a lot of these green upgrades have a very long life. And as long as they are running, you should see the benefits of those savings. In fact, if utility bills go up, those savings go up over time. So the question becomes, right, in terms of investing in green retrofits, you can get a lot more savings than in anything else. The issue I saw with that was that the numbers are so small, it just doesn't garner any attention. So I made this fictitious case study. What if I did 50 of those, right? And then let's start looking at the larger numbers, right? So if I did 50 of those same projects, which is what we do, right, my annual savings turn out to be one and a half million and not 30,000. My finan financing need is now 12 and a half million and not 250,000, right? So now that gives me a 50 unit complex, use, assuming that it's 250,000 per unit. Or I could get 22 and a half million dollars in utility savings over the life of that system. The rest is just math. If I have that one and a half million dollars in subsidy, that's $30,000 in subsidy per unit 2,500 per month, 
And then I divided it by 70% because that's what a 9% tax credit is. So I'm starting to get to the 9% tax credit and attack that one, the holy grail. Right? It's $1,750 per unit per month. And my point is either we can give a 9% for a new construction or I can invest that money in green rehab and get $1,750 of subsidy per month per unit for the same time period. And what is it that we want to do? So here's another one in terms of affordable housing and naturally occurring. So I took that 50 unit property and bear with me with the $730 per subsidy number. So if I had a $730 subsidy, then over the 50 units, this is just math, it's 437,000. And the capital needed to generate that subsidy of $437,000 for that property is 8.75 million, assuming a 5% cap rate, which is realistic, I think, in today's market. Right? So if I built a new property for 50 units with that $250,000 cost, my total cost was 12.5 million. The 9% in terms of 70% of that cost is that 8.75. So the point is, you can either build a unit or you can get a $730,000 tax uh, subsidy that you could use for acquiring the property or rehabbing that property per unit. And so we have to ask ourselves, a $730 per month per unit subsidy, is that more valuable for us versus a new unit? And I suspect it is. I'm going to look at the same numbers a different way now. Let's say it's the subsidy is $200 a month. And so this is just math, right? It adds up to 120,000 for the whole property. Capital needed to generate that subsidy is 2.4 million, which if I do the math in terms of if the acquisition cost was 160,000 for a unit, the total cost is 8 million. The LIHTC on 4% is 30%, so it's 30% of that 8 million, it's 2.4 million. And so the equivalent subsidy is 200 bucks per unit to get that unit into and remain an affordable housing unit. But when I compare that to the $730 needed for a new unit, it's about 3.6 times larger to build a new unit. So the point is, I'm saying, you could have 3.6 units subsidized, if you will, or retrofitted for the cost of building a new unit in terms of the way we are spending our subsidy. Last example. We keep talking about the fact that the 25% AMI or the lower AMI folks have a very difficult time. That's where the largest gap is. So I did the math, if it's 50% AMI in Denver metro area where the AMI is 66,000, this is just math, right? The difference between 50 and 25% AMI turns out is about $5,000 in subsidy that's needed to be able to afford a 25, 25 AMI percent AMI family to be able to afford a unit, which on a 5% rate of return is $99,000 rounded up to 100,000. And once again, that's two and a half times less, if you will, or if it takes 250,000 to build a new unit, we could house two and a half of these very low income folks at the same subsidy level as it takes to build one new unit. So. Once again, the point is, right, we can't build ourselves out of this problem. We've got to think differently on how we use our subsidies. So the solution is there. Can we make the policy changes, right? Can we think outside the box? Can, we should be able to solve this. And my three points to you are, let's fix these units, let's make them greener, let's reduce, reduce the utility costs, which we easily can, because that's the best bang for the buck. Let's do that first. Let's provide subsidy to the existing properties rather than lose them and try and build 
new ones because we can get 3.6 times as many of those going. And let's subsidize the acquisition of existing properties. And I think that's all I got. Thank you. We have about 10 minutes left for questions. So if there are questions from the audience or streaming audience, speak up. Kelly? Hi, this is for uh, Rafi. Um, I probably don't get in the weeds enough, but $250,000 for a new unit in a multifamily complex sale. I mean, I'm really surprised about how expensive. Hold on, let's okay, uh, switch microphone for you. Oh, okay. Or double check to make sure it's on. Uh, what is it? Um, I mean, I, I don't. I think I don't know what the median price of a home for sale is in Denver. I know it's high, it's probably higher than that, but um, it seems like even buying up single family homes, one maybe not in the best area, but one might be able to do that in Denver. I mean, why why is it two hundred fifty thousand? Why is that? so much different in Denver than it is in other places. I, I just, it was just more than I would have expected for a multifamily unit. So, so lots of reasons, right, including regulatory issues and things that have to be met, uh, the cost of construction being high, the cost of land being high, so on and so forth. But really the numbers still apply. So if you were in Albuquerque and it was 150,000 to build one, uh, turns out the rents are much cheaper. So the economics still don't change. Uh, in terms of why it's 250, as I said, lots of reasons, and it's gone up quite a bit in the last few years. Uh, but that's just what it is right now. We have a question right over there. Hi. A few years ago, well, or maybe half a decade ago, the Colorado Governor's Energy Office um, had some grants going for multifamily. Are we aware if they're still doing that or not? There's no grants right now for multifamily and, or from the energy office for rehab. Uh, all of that was basically ARA funding, stimulus money, oh. long gone. Okay, and then one other, um, and this may be a point to why it's so expensive in Colorado is water and su water tap fees are extremely high, especially um, for area for metro areas right outside of Denver, I think some suburban areas are twice the the rate of Denver. So, um, I guess for folks that aren't familiar with water rights, they're coming from the East Coast or, or wherever. It's it's a whole nother game here in Colorado. I did want to mention we are working on our commercial pace pilot program. We're working with Energy Outreach Colorado on that. And uh, they do have some resources that we'll be sharing in our owner toolkits. And as I said, they're going to be contributing some work to our pilot programs as well. So Katie, over here from the streaming audience, so kind of order one was for you as far as our other Habitat for Humanities doing preservation slash rehab work across the country. Yes. Um, Habitat is active in all 50 states and actually around the world, and this has been a big focus for Habitat nationally. Uh, just to add on, anybody that has a best practice out there as far as uh, that you guys look to, as far as Habitat affiliates? Hey, they are the best practice. <laughs> Um, a lot of, certainly in the preservation area, um, older cities tend to be more advanced in preservation, uh, particularly cities where land costs have gotten really high and there's less available land. So maybe cities more like Chicago, DC, Baltimore, DC, um, as opposed to um, Dallas or some of the southern cities where there's more land available for new construction. And a question for Beth that came up in regards to the database for Colorado as far as of properties. Is that part of a national database or is that Colorado specific and just developed here? Uh, some thoughts. Uh, this is from someone that does not have 
not aware of something like that in their state? The database that we have established is a Colorado database. So the restricting organizations in Colorado brought their data together to do it. However, there are national databases, and I know we have Laura Abernathy here from the National Housing Trust. She's going to be speaking later. But you, you might want to mention you guys have a preservation catalog as well. Uh, we do. So we'll Microphone coming your way. So actually, at the National Housing Trust, we host a national database called PresCat, which I'll be speaking about briefly. And it's a database, um, not of the property level data that Beth is speaking to, but of policy level data. Um, so about preservation policies existing on the state and local level across the country. Um, and also point to the National Low Income Housing Coalition. And they have the National Preservation Database. I think is what it's called, National Preservation Database. And that's publicly available online. And that is an aggregation of all of this data on the national level. Um, and you can search it by, obviously, state, by city. You can search as um, small an area as a congressional district. Um, and that's on the national level. So you can look at really whatever it is that you're looking for. Um, it doesn't provide sort of as much analysis as the database that Beth is talking about um, for Colorado specifically, but it's certainly a great starting point just for getting a sense of what the existing stock of affordable housing is in your area. Uh, Beth, how did you define uh, multifamily as far as number of units go? Um, how do we define how did we define multifamily in terms of number of units in the property what uh, Todd do you want to mention that I mean I assume it's five or more units yeah. Todd is uh, at Chaffa he's one of our great data organizers so anyway five or more units Yeah, I think you're right. And um, Beth, could you repeat the question We've, for our streaming audience? Okay, the, and that it's probably more stark since we don't have the one to four units in there. Also, I mean, in in our database, though, actually we do we do have some single families in there also, but we don't focus on those too much. I mean, we're trying to be uh, prioritize our resources and focus on some of those large ones, but we are looking in. Uh, when we're trying to develop additional resources, perhaps looking at uh, a program at some point for one to four units because they that's where a lot of the housing is and it is affordable. Yeah, I was concerned about some of the um, additional incentives available to smaller projects other than larger, bigger projects as far as preservation. Uh, particularly units are like, uh, say, 20, 30 units, properties that are looking to uh, go after green build or whatever for the preserving what additional incentives are there for these smaller properties to pursue preservation activities sure so um, some of these uh, incentives are irrespective of the size uh, so there are utility incentives for example rebates right uh, that's one uh, there's tax credits and tax depreciation and deductions etc of different kinds uh, so FHA has this green loan program, as does Fannie and Freddie. Uh, so those are some other kind of incentives. Uh, if you're doing solar that has its own investment tax credit, is irrespective of how many uh, units that you have. Uh, there could be various local grant funding opportunities. There's weatherization programs that Beth was talking about that Energy Outreach does here in Colorado, and there's weatherization agencies nationwide uh, that do that. So that's another incentive that you can access. And, and then there's just more specific incentives tied to where you are that you can access, uh, which could be something like a C pace or Colorado pace as she t or, or commercial pace or performance contract. So depending on what kind of property it is, uh, there might be different incentives that they might be able to avail. But as I mentioned, too, we are also, I mean, this is a future thing, but trying to explore the opportunities in a one to four unit program and under 50 unit programs, because we do feel there's a, a gap there. 
So Katie, question from streaming as well. Um, and it might be more for Ravi, how oh, about appetite for purchase and rehab of uh, market rate, naturally occurring affordable housing. What do you guys sense is the, the appetite to, to use funding to, to purchase this market rate property? Well, so what we've seen is back to my the, the anecdotal evidence of the CREJ uh, value-added developers from both coast sitting at the CREJ conferences. There's a huge appetite, especially in the Denver metro market. Uh, that's why we've seen such a huge run-up in, in, in pricing. Uh, so they get snapped up, and there's typically 10, 12, even 20 bids on a property that's naturally occurring affordable uh, once it goes up for sale. The issue is, can we preserve them and pay that differential, which right, the folks who buy it uh, fix it up a little bit and then increase rents by $200. And my point was, right, can we subsidize that $200 increase, which translates to a higher purchase price, basically? And either you sub subsidize the higher purchase price by subsidizing that, or you subsidize the $200 rent and keep it affordable. But the appetite is massive. I mean, I'm definitely very interested in that for us to pursue as a strategy. I mean, I think the, for example, the 60 to 120 percent of AMI, which really, I mean, we don't usually support those kind of projects with most of these subsidized programs. Th that's a real potential to help that range of incomes with doing something with naturally occurring affordable housing. But we've got to develop some additional resources that can be used for that. Um, I pulled up on Apartment Insights yesterday, um, and they do uh, Fort Collins, Greeley, metro area. There were, and they only deal with properties that are over 50 units, though. So, and we saw with the naturally occurring affordable housing, most of those are below 50 units. But I pulled up, I can't remember how many properties it was, but 200,000 units of the over 50 just in that main front range from Fort Collins to Colorado Springs. So there's huge opportunity there, and that's something we really need to look at. And so. I can speak a little bit on the home ownership side of portion of Habitat's work that I didn't talk as much about. Um, in addition to new, new homes that we sell, we also renovate and provide energy efficient upgrades to um, condos that are affordable to lower income families. Um, these, a lot of these condos would be affordable to lower income families um, to purchase uh, at uh, even below 50% of the area median income if they were able to compete in the market and qualify for financing. Um, so access to credit is a huge issue for low income families. Habitat um, is a lender in addition to a developer, so we're able to provide that access. Um, and then the ability to compete with rental investors. A lot of the condos that we're seeing are may go on the market, uh, and they're being purchased by um, people who intend to rent them as opposed to live in them. And it's really difficult for low-income families to compete in that kind of environment. It's honestly difficult for Habitat as well. Did you have a microphone over there? And then from uh, streaming, actually, there were a couple of folks that were interested in the working group, preservation working group that you have going on. Uh, how long has the group been together, and do you have some successes you could share? Um, the, I, I'm not exactly sure when it first started, um, but it's been a couple of years at least that it's been sort of a loose organization. But I think, um, and, and the database was put together and worked on during that time. And the database really became operational earlier this year. Um, so that really provided the platform to you know, jumpstart the work that was going on. And I came on to Chaffa in April of this year. So we formalized a more um, quarterly working group structure then. We've got a couple of subcommittees, a properties group that looks at these high risk properties and follows, tries to follow up on them. Um, uh, the data committee and operations and strategy, we're sort of developing a little ad hoc financing subcommittee. Um, but the for more formalized structure really happened this year. But it's been going on for a couple of years, and a lot of great work was done and got us to this point to really be able to launch it a little bit more this year. Um, and what was there? There was something else? Successes. Some successes, successes that you could share? Um, 
we have done some uh, preservation projects. Chaffa has funded some preservation uh, projects this year. We are working on one in Denver right now that has been preserved yet. And to, this is one of the more higher risk ones. So some of the preservation ones we've done, funded this year, um, probably weren't really at risk of being lost, some of those. But we're working on one right now that really is at risk of being lost in Denver. And um, we'll have to see which way it goes. But if, if we can preserve it, it would be a, a big part of it is because of Denver's preservation ordinance and that right of first refusal. But the, you've got that right of first refusal, but you've got to come up with the money still, too. So, <laughs> so that's what we're working on now. What is the impact of the Colorado um, condo construction defect law on the provision of affordable or availability construction maintenance of affordable housing units? I can speak to that. It certainly has a huge impact on um, the availability of homeownership opportunities for lower income families that one, two, sometimes even three bedroom condo that may be naturally occurring for someone 60% of the area median income or less. It's a great starter house, something, an opportunity for a family to build equity before maybe purchasing something bigger down the road is essentially not available. Only 3% of all of the units being developed in Denver right now are condos. Um, and something around uh, 25, even 30, would be a much more healthy level for our community. Katie, that'll have to be the last question if you want to close out the panel. Absolutely. Well, please join me in thanking Beth and Ravi. It was so nice to have you here. And thanks to all of you for uh, the good conversation that followed. Thanks. thanks. All right, thanks so much. And uh, for our streaming audience, we're going to be taking a short break. Uh, and we will be resuming program at 1220. Uh, with Laura Abernathy uh, with uh, National Housing Trust. So Denver audience uh, will be giving some logistics as far as lunch. Streaming audience, we look forward to you staying connected and being back with us at 1220 Mountain Standard Time. Thanks so much.
All right, so welcome back, Denver audience and also our streaming audience. Thank you so much for staying with us. Uh, next, we have uh, Laura Abernathy. She's the director, state and local policy for the National Housing Trust. And had the opportunity to, her bio is in the packet, by the way, and for those of you that are streaming, it's also on the link, as it is with all of our presenters today. Uh, had the fortune of, of getting to connect with, with uh, Laura in New Mexico at the housing conference there earlier this year. And, you know, also she was here in, in Colorado and thought, you know, this is a conversation that needs to, to occur uh, more often. It's something that we need to talk about. Uh, as I made with my uh, morning remarks um, in regards to the preservation conversation. So we wanted to make sure that we brought Laura back to Colorado and have her share her thoughts as far as what she's seen in the preservation world uh, from a national perspective. And I'm sure we'll have lots of questions for her. Uh, those of you that are streaming again, welcome back. And uh, Laura Abernathy, please. All right, good afternoon. And please can continue to eat, obviously, while I speak. Go ahead and help yourself to more on all of that. I will not be offended, I promise. Um, so I'm Laura Abernathy. I represent the National Housing Trust, um, coming from Washington, DC. Um, I want to start with a couple of disclaimers. Um, though I am coming from DC, I do not work in federal policy. Um, so probably now more than ever, there are questions swirling around what will or will not be happening. Um, on the federal landscape. Uh, those are important questions. I am not the right person to answer them. <laughs> so sorry about that. Um, secondly, uh, nor am I an expert on Colorado. So um, the National Housing Trust, There we go. Um, we're a nonprofit organization that is devoted entirely to the preservation of existing affordable housing across the country. Um, we do that in a number of ways. We do that through real estate development, where we actually purchase uh, and rehabilitate existing affordable housing. We do that through lending, where we make loans to uh, nonprofits that are looking to do similar work than, uh, as we are. Um, and we do public policy, which is what I do specifically. So we do do federal policy. Um, I don't do that, however. <laughs> we do energy policy, uh, which speaks to some of what Ravi was saying in the earlier presentation. What I do is state and local policy. So I'm the director of state and local policy, and we engage with cities and states all over the country um, about policies and programs aimed at preserving existing affordable housing. So that's the perspective that I can offer. I can give a national perspective on what different states and different cities and different communities across the country are doing to address um, the need for preserving affordable housing. Um, I will say, again, that I'm not an expert on Colorado. We did, however, work uh, very closely with a number of groups here in Denver, specifically Enterprise Community Partners brought us in and we worked with Mile High Connects um, to provide some recommendations and some best, best practices that led to um, the existing preservation ordinance here at the city level um, that Beth mentioned earlier. So we do have working knowledge of Denver um, and Colorado. Um, so that's a little bit about who we are. Um, normally when I, nope, I always pick the wrong one, there we go. <laughs> normally when I am in a state talking about preservation, I like to start with a number of slides that sort of lays out the issue, lays out why we're even talking about preservation, why it's an important thing for us to consider, talk about the cost effectiveness of it, um, how it is energy efficient and lay, basically make the case for preservation. I skipped over all those slides today because I think that that case has already been made um, and very well. I would be repeating things that you have already heard today, so I'm not going to go through that. Um, so instead, I'm going to start talking about what some of the solutions are to preserving existing affordable housing. Um, so this slide sort of lays out a few of the key components to an effective preservation strategy. Um, and you're really lucky being here in Colorado that Colorado is actually a leader um, in preserving affordable housing. And if you look at these components, you'll hear or you'll recognize that we've already heard about the very significant work, excuse me, that players in Denver and Colorado are already doing around this. So we heard about data collection and analysis, excuse me, 
And that really is the first step in an effective preservation policy. If you don't know what properties you already have, you can't possibly begin to preserve them because you simply have no sense of what's already there. Um, Beth spoke about how that data is uh, being considered on the statewide level here in Colorado. Uh, policy and program coordination, again, Beth spoke about <laughs> how that's working really well here um, in Denver by having players, all of whom are concerned um, about preservation, just having them have conversations together and work on this as a united team. Uh, we've seen what we call preservation collaboratives, uh, very similar to what Beth has described, work very successfully across the country in a number of different cities, a number of different states. Um, sort of anecdotally, I like to tell a story about how we've seen sort of through the lack of this coordination actually creates impediments to preservation. So if I am a mission-minded developer who wants to preserve the property down the block, uh, so is Beth perhaps. She also is a mission-minded preservation developer who wants to preserve that same property down the block. We're not talking to each other. I don't know that Beth wants to preserve it. She doesn't know that I want to preserve it. So we both end up bidding on that same property. We're competing against each other. We're driving up the cost of that property and it becomes more expensive for both of us to preserve that property. Uh, something as simple as that can be um, resolved simply by having conversations uh, with your peers, your peers being other people who are interested in preservation. Um, so that's a fairly simple example um, of what can work very effectively and what uh, is already working very effectively here. Um, dedicated funding for preservation. Um, you know, we heard actually earlier today um, about the preservation ordinance and how that gives a tool to the city or their designated partner to intervene and preserve a property. Um, what it doesn't do is provide funding for it. So that's one of the challenges is still going out and finding a source of funding for it. Um, what will probably be no surprise to anyone is that I'm not going to reveal any secrets about what this you know, magical dedicated source of funding is because I don't know either, um, but it is obviously important. And then a commitment to sustainability and really that is integral in all of these other components that we've touched on. Um, you heard Ravi talk about it earlier. Um, some of my colleagues back at the National Housing Trust are very devoted to this in working in 12 states across the country with utility companies and sort of similar to this idea of getting preservation um, minded folks in the room and talking to each other, having utility companies talk to multifamily owners, um, we have found is a huge help in getting resources directed towards multifamily housing. Um, there, and I'm forgetting the exact numbers, but there is a huge amount of money that utilities have um, to devote to essentially increasing the energy efficiency of properties, and that number continues to increase. Um, and simply by having conversations with your utility companies, you can find that those resources are available, and you can pretty easily encourage the utility companies to devote that funding to multifamily affordable housing. And then that ends up trickling down to benefit the residents in the way that Ravi told us about this morning. Um, so those are the, some of the key components. Um, to a successful preservation strategy. The one that I want to focus on, at least for right now, is dedicated funding for preservation. So we heard, <clears throat> excuse me, from a number of our speakers about the Low Income Housing Tax Credit Program, and that is the largest source of funding nationally for the creation and preservation of affordable housing. Um, it would probably, wouldn't be fair for me to acknowledge the fact that there are are some questions surrounding that program moving forward. But what I will be talking about is sort of what we know right now, how things have, continue, have been working for that. Um, and that's sort of all we can speak to right now. So, sorry, I did the wrong way again. Um, what is missing, unfortunately, from this presentation is sort of a transition slide explaining the low income housing tax credit program. I suspect that for many of you in the room, that would be boring old news anyhow. <laughs> um, but very br briefly, the Low Income Housing Tax Credit Program is a program that's administered by the US um, Treasury. Money is allocated to states based on their population. And then the housing finance agency in each state, um, so the agency that Chris represents, CHAFA, 
Um, they then distribute that money to developers in that state to develop affordable housing. Um, in turn, those tax credits are then sold so that the developer ends up with cash to then put into their property. They don't really, as a developer, you don't want the tax credit necessarily. You need money. You need equity to put into your property. Um, as Chris mentioned, there is a much greater demand for these tax credits than there are actual tax credits to give out. And that's not unique to, um, to Colorado. That's pretty universal. So what the housing finance agency do, what Chaffa has done, is create what's called a qualified allocation plan, a QAP, which is a document that outlines the priorities for allocating these credits to the developers. Again, because there are far fewer um, tax credits to go around than there is demand for the tax credits, states, almost every state comes up with a basically a scoring system where they say, these are our priorities. If you meet this many of them and score X number of points, then you're going to get the tax credit. So if I've applied for tax credits and I've you know, gone through the checklist and I've scored 55 points on that checklist, and another developer has done the same thing, gone through that checklist, and determined that they scored 85, that developer that scored more points than I did excuse me, has a better chance of earning those tax credits than I do. So this qualified allocation plan sets out the priorities that a state has for distributing the tax credits. Uh, what works really nicely about this from our perspective is that each state has an opportunity to define these priorities for themselves. So Texas has different needs than Colorado, which has different needs than California, has different needs than New York, and so on. So the tax credit program allows each state to determine for themselves what their priorities are. Is it preservation? Is it senior housing? Is it supportive housing? Is it rural housing? Is it a combination of all of those things? Um, each state is different, has different needs, uh, different priorities, different political climate, and so the QAP allows each state to come up with those priorities on themselves. So what this map illustrates is how each state within that qualified allocation plan is incentivizing preservation. So there's a few ways in which states in their qualified allocation plan can incentivize, again, whatever it is they decide to incentivize. In this case, we'll talk about preservation. Uh, they can have what's called a threshold. So they'll say to even qualify for these tax credits, you have to do X, Y, and Z. Um, they can have points where they say, okay, if you are a preservation project, we're gonna give you X number of points to make you more competitive for these tax credits. Um, and then they can also have um, a set aside where they may say, look, preservation is so important to us as a state that we're going to set aside a certain percentage of all statewide tax credits and those are all going to go to preservation or those are all going to go to rural housing or those are all going to go to senior housing um, or some combination of all of those. I've seen QAPs that have set asides for all of those priorities and more. Um, so what this map does is show how in 2016, each state incentivized preservation in their QAP. Um, so green states, those are, those, those are the states that have a preservation set aside. The blue states are those that have points for properties who are um, applying as a preservation project. Um, the sort of yellowish orange states are those that don't have a numerical priority, but they say we're really into preservation uh, without assigning points to it. Um, and like Missouri, for instance, their entire QAP um, doesn't have any points. So the fact that they don't assign points to preservation doesn't mean they don't care about it. That's just not how they have structured their QAP. Um, and then the gray states, of which there aren't many, um, have no preference for preservation at all. Um, and a number of states you'll see both have a set aside and points for preservation, sort of a variety of ways to incentivize preservation. Um, a couple of things that I should have already said about this. One is that when we define preservation in terms of this map, um, I'm using the definition that each state may have. So within the QAP, each state can define preservation differently, and they all do define it differently. So the way that California defines preservation for their set aside uh, is likely, and in fact is very different than how Texas defines preservation for its set aside. Um, so when I talk about preservation on a state level, and it, when looking at this map and thinking about preservation, preservation is defined by that state. So it might mean something slightly different in each state. Um, 
I'm trying to think of what else it is that I wanted to say on this one. Um, the other point that I would make is that although a preservation set aside is really the strongest way to incentivize preservation because you're setting a floor for the minimum amount of preservation that you're going to do, um, even as a preservation minded organization. We don't want necessarily for this whole map to look green uh, because we understand that different states have different needs and work very differently. We appreciate that each state comes up with their own way to address preservation. So in fact, if you'd seen this map a year, maybe two years ago, uh, North Dakota would have been gray. It had no preference for preservation. In fact, they actually said that preservation projects weren't even allowed to apply for the 9% credit. And when we saw that in their QAP, that was sort of a red flag, and we thought, hold on, what's happening? This doesn't seem right. So this is simplification, but basically we picked up the phone and said, hey, North Dakota, like, what's happening? Why um, aren't you allowing preservation projects to apply? And they explained to us that because of the huge influx of workers in the state because of the oil industry, they simply had to keep building housing. They just couldn't keep up with demand and they just had to build, build, build. And so for a very finite period of time, they were only going to do new construction. And although we don't think that that is an approach that other states should mirror, we understood that that is a unique situation for North Dakota. And so we said, okay, North Dakota, that's fine. We understand what you're doing. And now, you know, things have changed and you see that they actually not only allow preservation projects to, al to apply for 9% projects, um, but they actually provide points to incentivize them and make them more competitive to actually um, win those tax credits. So it was just for a small period of time where they said, look, this is a weird time for us and incentivizing preservation isn't going to help us meet our goals. And we said, okay, that's what you're facing in your state and that's unique to you, so we appreciate that you're thinking about it um, and addressing it in the way that you are. So a quick um, sort of overview of this, 47 states, including DC, prioritize preservation. Uh, 17 states have a set aside and 37 states use points. And again, as I said, many states um, use a combination of both. And so that map, uh, what looks at the priorities in QAP, sets out what a state intends to do, the priorities that they put in their QAP, and what they want to see happen with their tax credits. This next slide shows us um, low-income housing tax credit preservation allocation. So it shows us where's the money actually going. The last slide was what does a state intend to do with that money. This, uh, this slide is where is that money actually going. This slide is for 2015. The last slide was for 2016. So you can't do a direct overlay, um, but that's because the allocation year will always be one year behind because of when those allocations actually take place. Um, so this map shows the percentage of uh, low-income housing tax credits that went to preservation in a given state. Um, what I should say, and what I should have said on the previous slide as well, is that this applies to the 9% competitive tax credit program. So neither of these slides are incorporating the 4% program. Um, but in this map, eight of the states allocated over 50% of their total low-income housing tax credit allocation um, towards preservation, and not all of those have set-asides. It's not that all of those have a 50% set-aside for it. So this just speaks to the fact that different incentives work very differently in different states depending on how that QAP is set up. So again, we don't want the whole previous map to look green because everyone has established a set-aside because other incentives can work just as effectively, if not more so. Um, 11 states allocated between 30 and 50% of their tax credits uh, to preservation in 2015. 11 states plus New York City allocated 15 to 29% of their statewide allocation to preservation. And 10 states allocated up to 15%. Um, of their statewide 9% allocation to preservation. Um, you'll note when I was talking about those who allocated between 15 and 29%, I mentioned New York City. So when I explained very briefly the tax credit program, I talked about money going to the states. In a very few instances, a number of cities also receive a direct allocation. So New York City receives money separate from the money that New York State receives. Chicago receives money separate from the state, uh, I'm sorry, separate from the money that Illinois receives. And Minnesota actually is set up into seven different allocating agencies. Here in Colorado, there's CHAFA 
and they oversee the allocations for the entire state of Colorado, um, including all of the cities. Um, so in Colorado specifically, you'll see um, right there on the map, and I did some research to break it down beyond just the percentages. Um, in 2015, 54 units were preserved with the 9% tax credit program, um, and 105 units were preserved with the 4% tax credit program, that's statewide. Um, you'll notice that I talked about the 4% program there when I broke it down, although that's not illustrated on the map. What I do want to say is that the 4% program is becoming increasingly popular um, and increasingly valuable around the country. So in the last five years, or I'm sorry, I should step back to explain the difference. So the 9% program um, is a competitive program. And so when Chris talked about there being three times greater demand for tax credits than there are actual tax credits to be allocated, he's talking about the competitive 9% program where there is a cap, there is a limit to how much money the state has to distribute. With the 4% program, um, there is not that limit. Um, and in many states, it is a underutilized resource where there are 4% tax credits that sit there and that at the end of the year haven't been used. Um, so a number of states, and Colorado is one of them, have started to recognize like, wait, we consider ourselves you know, strapped for cash. We don't have enough resources. But at the same time, we have this 4% resource that is being undersubscribed. So how do we make developers consider using the 4% program? And so what Colorado and a number of other states are doing are pushing projects to the 4% program, and not just any projects, but preservation projects specifically. So some states are very explicitly saying, look, if you're coming in for tax credits, if you're a preservation project, you have to go through the 4% program. If you prove to us that the 4% program will not work for you, only then will we consider funding you with the 9% program. Um, so that's a way to push a select number of projects, mostly preservation projects, to the 4% program, use that existing resource, um, which then frees up more of the competitive 9% tax credits to go towards other properties that may not otherwise receive any funding, so they wouldn't otherwise be preserved or developed at all. Um, over the last five years, we've seen uh, the dollar value of 4% credits that are being utilized increase by over 100%. So states are absolutely recognizing, hold on, we have this resource here, we have to figure out how to use it, and the way that they're using it is by saying, look, preservation projects, you gotta go through the 4% program. So this map doesn't reflect that. Um, Probably next week when I'm back in my office, I will make that, off, that map because as the 4% becomes a more valuable resource, that is absolutely uh, something that we want to start looking at and start considering. And so what I want to talk about next are sort of some emerging trends in the tax credit program. Um, so you heard Beth mention when she was talking about um, the risk analysis matrix for sort of identifying which properties that are going to lose their subsidy, which are the ones that we need to prioritize. If we take, um, you know, if we start from the premise that we can't preserve all of them, which are the ones that we are going to pr um, prioritize? Um, and she mentioned considering areas of opportunity in that analysis, and that's something that a number of states are doing within their QAP. So this came out of a number of conversations um, that have been happening nationally one being the Supreme Court case last summer um, involving Texas, um, and then related to that, HUD's affirmatively furthering fair housing rule, which says, um, look, we as an industry have to consider that housing is not just a roof over one's head, but there are other components that contribute to um, housing being a valuable resource, access to education, access to jobs. Um, basically, look, let's not concentrate low income housing in areas of poverty and racial concentration. So what else do we need to consider when we think about citing affordable housing? Uh, so a number of states have started actively considering those items within their QAP. Um, just like with preservation, where each state defines preservation differently, each state defines opportunity differently. Um, again, we as an organization believe that that is absolutely appropriate. Um, opportunity does look different in different states, and probably even on a smaller scale than a state, opportunity looks different in different communities. Um, so what this chart shows, and I hope it's large enough that you can actually see it, um, is our best attempt at sort of 
trying to make what we'll call buckets for how states are considering opportunity. So again, a number of definitions for that, but sort of four main components jumped out when we started looking at QAPs and areas of opportunity. So a number of states are considering economics uh, and job growth in a community. A number of states are considering good schools and access to education. Uh, a number of states are looking at low poverty in a community, and a number of states are looking at community stability. Um, community stability is also something that is yet to be defined um, by anyone but the state, but that was sort of our best attempt to categorize them. Um, and so each state not only ha have these various definitions, but then have um, a variety of ways to actually incentivize them. So I believe it's Massachusetts that if we look on there, we can see that they actually consider all four of those components and they sort of spell them out and they use publicly available data um, to say whether your property would or would not, uh, you know, receive points for economics and job growth, receive points for good schools, receive points for low poverty, and receive points for community stability. So they consider all four of those separately within their QAP. Um, Illinois, for example, takes a slightly different approach. Um, not only, well, A, they don't consider all of those factors, um, but they also create an, inde an index where they've weighted all of these things statewide, and they've come out with a map where you can very easily see, is my property in an area of opportunity or not. So they've already aggregated all of the components that they think contribute to opportunity um, for you. And it's just sort of a yes or no, whether it is or isn't in an area of opportunity. Um, and Shafa recently in their summary of changes for the 2017 QAP um, sort of put in a footnote that said that they're considering adding this component related to areas of opportunity in the QAP. Um, so that's something to keep an eye out for in Colorado. Um, like I said, it's an emerging trend. So I'm going to move quickly through the next few maps. In 2010, um, only five states considered these areas of opportunity. And then they slowly started increasing six in 2011. And then a few more started adding on. And by 2015, uh, it was up to 16. And if we looked at 2016, I don't have a map for that. Uh, but it would be even greater than that. So more and more states are starting to consider areas of opportunity in their QAPs. Excuse me. And then sort of what we call the balanced approach is considering not only areas of opportunity in sort of these areas where you have access to good schools, to healthcare, low poverty, all of that, but let's not swing the pendulum so far in that direction in how we think about allocating our tax credits that we forget about existing communities where we've already maybe cited affordable housing, but that maybe is historically distressed. Um, just because it's important to consider these quote unquote areas of opportunity, we shouldn't do so at the expense of abandoning existing communities. So we refer to that as the balanced approach, as does HUD conveniently. Um, and so that's the next thing that we've been looking at in QAPs are not only how do they consider areas of opportunity, but what do they do to consider um, community revitalization as well? And so this chart, um, there's a lot going on in there. And so it's not really meant to be incredibly informative. What it is meant to do is show you the variety of ways uh, in which states are considering community revitalization plans within their QAP. So this specifically, I should say, relates to community revitalization plans and not just community revitalization. Any housing finance agency would say, hold on, everything we do is about community revitalization, and they would be absolutely right. Um, so our best attempt to sort of wrap our heads around this, <laughs> what's going on with the, in the QAPs, is to narrow that def definition to community revitalization plans. Um, so the federal government says that each state has to consider community revitalization plans in their QAP and as they're allocating the tax credits. Uh, what they don't do is supply a definition of what a community revitalization plan actually is. Uh, so that's left up to the states to do. Um, again, I'll repeat what I've said before. We think that's absolutely appropriate because each state has different needs um, and different economics going on, all sorts of different things. So that decision should be left up to the states to define a community revitalization plan. Um, but what this chart does is show 
um, at least at a handful of the ways in which states are defining community revitalization plans. So some states are using proxy designations and just saying, look, if you fall in an enterprise zone, we're gonna count that as a community revitalization plan. Or New Mexico, for instance, has a Main Street program, and they say, if you're you know, within that geographical area, that counts as a community revitalization plan. Um, some states require community outreach within this plan, so the idea being that, you know, I as a developer can't just write community revitalization plan on the piece of paper and suddenly qualify for these points, but I actually have to work with the community that I'm trying to revitalize. Um, endorsement by local official and or government, that same idea that this plan involves that local government, um, that they are part of this, they as well are committed to revitalizing that area in which you're essentially asking for money in the form of tax credits. Um, an assessment of existing structures and or need for housing, um, given that the qualified allocation plan is specifically and exclusively about affordable housing, I at least suspected that more of these definitions would necessitate an analysis of existing housing. That's not always true though. Um, and then I sort of put in that bottom row of other, which is sort of a catch-all with the understanding that everything that every um, housing finance agency does is somehow related to community revitalization. So I recognize that these categories aren't all encompassing. Um, and then, this next one um, is sort of a deeper analysis of what states are doing surrounding community revitalization. So some states are not just saying, okay, look, you have to have a community revitalization plan, but they're actually going back and saying that they're going to measure the impact of that plan. They're saying we're going to evaluate the revitalization that actually took place. Um, so there's just a small number of states that are considering A, implementation, and B, measure of impact. Uh, but it really is this idea of, the plan has to go beyond just a piece of paper. It's not just a plan, it's about the revitalization that actually takes place in a community. And so a number of the states, those that you see listed here, are really trying to quantify what revitalization looks like. Um, my best guess um, is that HFAs are interested in this so that they can excuse me, continue to develop and improve their own definition of a community revitalization plan, because if they have a better understanding of what actually leads to significant revitalization, they can then require other plans to encompass similar things, which then leads to greater revitalization. Um, so these are a number of states that are considering that. Um, what I should say is that all of our work related to community revitalization and community revitalization plans um, is informed by Rebecca Peace at the Pennsylvania Housing Finance Agency and Mark Shelburne at Novogratik, um, who have done a lot of work on this and really worked with us in coming up with these definitions. Um, and so thinking about community revitalization as the balance to areas of opportunity is a way to think holistically about an entire state, all of the communities within a given state, and not abandoning one or the other. Um, and you heard me speak briefly, um, actually during Beth's presentation, about PresCat, which is an online database that we, the National Housing Trust, developed along with Novogratik. Um, and I bring that up only because it is a resource for um, state and local preservation policies and programs across the country. So where I've shown maps and sort of given a high level overview of what's going on across the country, what this does is allow you to drill down to what those policies actually are. So it'll help you look at best practices um, across the country. It'll help you if you're in Colorado and just want to know more about what's going on in Colorado, you can search Colorado and look at different categories, and we've pulled out the policies from their QAP, so you don't have to read their entire QAP. Or if you're thinking about, and I'll go back to areas of opportunity, if Chaffa is considering uh, in, uh, including areas of opportunity in their next QAP, if they were to go to PresCat and search areas of opportunity, they could see what every other state in the country is doing as far as defining areas of opportunity. So this idea that no one needs to reinvent the wheel, um, other states are dealing with very similar issues and housing finance agencies should be learning from each other rather than starting from scratch. So this is a great resource for that. Um, and with that, I will go to questions. Thank you. Questions from the audience? Okay, over there. Microphone's coming your way. 
Hi. So um, although the QAPs don't address qualified census tracts, um, so there's no priority in that, by the fact that you're getting a boost with the qualified census tracts, it's making your project more financially feasible. So you trend to have more projects in lower income areas. Do you think that's ever going to be looked at? And um, I don't really quite know what's going to happen with the new affirmatively furthering fair housing rule under the new administration. Um, but do you think, because what I see is it's, it's counter to the whole idea of uh, deconcentrating. And, and then I have a second question. Do you think rent control in New York um, City affects why they maybe don't have a preservation um, or, or a preservation preference? Preference, sure. So to your first question, um, and to explain that a little bit, so the federal government requires that each state uh, provide a 30% basis boost to projects that are located in qualified census tracts or difficult development areas. Um, so if you are in a qualified census tract and you have one, essentially, the credits within a given state, you still have to go through that competitive process. Um, but if you go through that and are considered a winner and get the point, uh, I'm sorry, get the credits, then they will give you a 30% basis boost um, so that in the end, essentially, you're receiving more credits. There's more money going into your project. Um, to your point, exactly, it doesn't help you win the project in the end. It just gives you more money to develop or preserve the project. Um, so I think, and this is where the balanced approach really I think is key, if I'm understanding your question correctly, um, that, and this is consistent with what the Supreme Court has said, and this is consistent with what, with what HUD has said, is that it's very important that states consider both locating housing in perhaps areas where they have low income housing traditionally hasn't been located. So that's these areas of opportunity, high income areas, access to education, access to jobs, access to healthcare, all of that, while simultaneously continuing to invest in existing communities. So I think the trend that we've seen and that we saw sort of in those five or six maps that I went through of states increasingly considering and starting to define areas of opportunity will, serve to counterbalance what may be a historical trend of locating housing in qualified census tracts, which are essentially concentrations of poverty. Um, does that get to your question? Okay. Um, I'm sorry, can you repeat your second question? Oh, the second one was about rent control. Oh, sure. Sure, um, and this isn't going to be a helpful answer, but what I will tell you is that I'm working right now with uh, LISC in New York City. Um, as I mentioned, a couple of cities, including New York City, receive a separate allocation from the state. And so New York City, being one of those cities, has a QAP that is separate from the New York State QAP. Um, LISC, to their credit, recognized, hold on, the New York City QAP really hasn't been updated in a while and they really need to rethink some of their priorities. So they ask us to come help them and say, look, these are what other cities are doing around these issues that you've identified as important and we can help sort of advocate for those. Um, so I think that New York is a unique example in that way, in that a, it has various allocating agencies, and actually there are two allocating agencies for the state of New York as well. So there are three allocating agencies in the state in its entirety because you have New York City and you have two New York State allocating agencies. Um, and that sort of makes it a separate beast. Um, one thing that we've seen in New York that is very specific to New York um, is that there is no preference, it's specific to New York City, there's no preference for access to transit. And when we first saw that, we thought, hold on, that seems crazy um, of any place, New York City should really consider access to transit as a priority for siding low-income housing. Then we thought, wait, actually, there's so much transit in New York City that everyone would get those points, and so it really wouldn't matter anyhow. Um, so this is going beyond your question, I apologize. <laughs> um, my best guess is that yes, rent control pays, plays into that. I don't know specifically, I haven't looked at those policies outside of the QAP in New York, I apologize. So Laura from the streaming, uh, uh, or actually this one's mine, but uh, best practices across the country. So who's doing really well, one or two states that, that you kind of hold in high regard? Yeah. And from the streamers was, uh, 
tied to this, I would imagine, areas of opportunity, would you consider that a best practice as far as adopting the AOP? Sure. Uh, so to your first question, I'm actually going to uh, consider cities rather than states in answering that question. Um, and the first that comes to mind, and I would say this no matter where I was, but would be Denver. Um, so especially with the recently, um, I'll say, enhanced preservation ordinance, that has given as Beth has mentioned, and as many of you may already know, the right for the city or a designated partner to intervene and to preserve a property. So if I own a property that is going, and the subsidy is going to expire, I have to tell the city about that. Um, and then if I have gone out and I have negotiated a sale to my buddy uh, over here for X amount of dollars, then the city or a developer that they've identified, they can come in and for that same price that I would be getting from my friend down the street, they can purchase the property and preserve it. So I, as the original owner, am getting the same amount of money that I was ever going to get, so presumably that's a pretty good deal for me. The city then is preserving this property, that's a great deal for the city because as we've heard, uh, preservation is not only cheaper, but if we want to ever even think of addressing the affordable housing crisis, we have to preserve because we're losing housing faster than we're creating housing, so it really has to be both approaches. Uh, related to that would be DC. Um, so whereas the city of Denver grants that right, a first refusal to the city, in DC we have what's called TOPA, Tenants Opportunity to Purchase Act, and it grants that same right, a first refusal to the tenants. Um, and that expands uh, not only to subsidized or low-income housing, but market rate rental housing as well. Any rental housing um, is subject to TOPA. So where I used to live in DC was a condo. Um, the owner from whom I was renting lived in California and he decided he was going to stay living in California. He had no interest in coming back to DC, so he was going to sell our unit. It was a market rate unit, uh, but because of TOPA, we were grant, we as, tenants, meaning my roommate and I, were granted TOPA rights. So even though it wasn't an affordable housing unit, we were granted those same rights and we were allowed um, to exercise our right of first refusal. We could come in and we were given first option to purchase at the, his negotiated price with another party. Um, in DC, we've seen that tenants have become increasingly sophisticated. Um, they sort of band together in many cases when their housing, um, is at risk of being sold, and they actually are putting out requests for proposals where several developers, NHT um, being one of them, will come in and respond to that, and essentially, we have to make the case to the residents that we're the best developer for them to select, and in many cases, we're very lucky that they do select us, um, but the tenants are really in the position of power in this situation. They get to choose who they want to work with. Um, and I think you had a second question. Areas of opportunity. <laughs> Areas of opportunity. Right. Uh, yes, I would absolutely say that that is the best practice, an emerging best practice, um, by which I mean the inclusion of this consideration. What I don't yet feel comfortable um, you know, holding up as a best practice is any given state's definition of um, an area of opportunity. And there are a couple different reasons for that. One, which is, as I already said, each state uh, not only can, but absolutely should consider areas of opportunity very differently. So what works for Colorado as an area of opportunity may not be the right definition for Idaho. And so I wouldn't begin to suggest that one state just borrow another state's um, definition. The other reason that it's hard to pinpoint to, and I won't even say best practices, but really, um, language that's working very effectively around areas of opportunity is because it is an emerging trend. So again, in 2010, there were only five states that even considered areas of opportunity. Um, so as states are including increasingly sophisticated language around areas of opportunity, a real question that we as the National Housing Trust have for these states is, okay, you put that language in a couple years ago, is it actually achieving the results that you wanted? Um, you know, you've gone through a couple of allocation rounds perhaps, and our properties ending up where you would hope that they would end up. Uh, the truth is that in some cases, the answer to that is no. Uh, we've talked to a couple states who went through very, uh, a very lengthy process um, of defining areas of opportunity and coming up with ways to incentivize their development and then 
uh, one, two, maybe three allocation rounds happened, and they went and they looked at where the properties were ending up, and they were like, oh, this isn't at all what we wanted to happen. So <laughs> back to the drawing board. Um, so because this is so new, we're still sort of gathering that information from states, and states themselves are still gathering that information too, to even say, look, is our are our policies meeting our intended purposes? Um, so the inclusion of language, I would say, is great, and we want more states to start doing that. But as far as what that language should look like, um, I don't have a good answer for that. Will you guys join me in thanking Laura for her presentation today? And if I could have the next panel uh, start to come up, please. Again, as a reminder, um, all the PowerPoint presentations, we're going to be loading them on the site. We'll be uh, sharing that link with you uh, if you haven't already been out there. And so our next panel, Leveraging tool and po Tools and Policy for Preservation. So we're going to be hearing from Allison George, Director of Colorado Division of Housing. Uh, Doug Selby is going to be joining us. He's the Housing Program Manager for OED for the City and County of Denver. And then Desa West, Executive Director of Mile High Connects. And if I could just remind everybody to turn those microphones on. Yeah, that would be great. Thanks. Terrific. And we'll get started. And I'm just, uh, again, bios are in your packet, so I'm going to pass it on to Allison to, to get us started. Do you have a clicker? Oh, and you do. Thank you, Ariel. Um, well, welcome every day, er, everyone. Uh, it sounds like you have had quite the day uh, talking about preservation and affordable housing. So my name is Allison George. I'm the director for the Division of Housing um, at the state in DOLA, which is the Department of Local Affairs. Um, lots of friends in the audience. And I also imagine with the 15 different states represented uh, that we have uh, lots of uh, national friends too. So I want to tell you a little bit about the state. We are not the HFA, we are not CHAFA. We have two state housing entities. We are a statewide housing authority um, with the mission to create and improve access for all Coloradans to decent, affordable housing. Has anybody read the newspaper lately? <laughs> you weren't supposed to laugh. <laughs> I'm not laughing um, because the challenge is ahead of all of us. Um, and that challenge is multifold. Um, so real quick, what we do, uh, we do rental subsidies. So we manage over 7,000 vouchers around the state. Um, over 84% of our vouchers actually serve people with disabilities. That is a very unique aspect for a housing authority. That's not um, the, traditionally the focus. Usually it's more around 25 to 30%. Um, for a housing authority, so we have a focus on serving people with disabilities, folks with the greatest needs uh, for housing assistance. Uh, we are also the gap funder uh, for housing, so we work with CHAFA frequently um, on new construction projects in particular to help fill that gap so that the tax credit program can help serve folks with the very low incomes. Um, we also work with partners to acquire and to rehabilitate housing, and I see some of our partners actually here in this room uh, where we've helped fund the acquisition of affordable housing uh, to help maintain that and to create deed-restricted affordable housing, and we'll get more into that as well. Uh, we are the administrator for the Fort Lyon uh, supportive um, community down in Bent County. Um, and that is for uh, people with addictions. Since 2013, we've served, served over 700 people um, with addictions uh, coming from homelessness in the effort to stabilize their lives. And we'll get more into that as well. And you know, we're actually the building department for the state. Isn't that surprising? Well, for counties that don't have their own building departments, we'll actually, we have inspectors that will come in and help ensure the, the life safety um, and uh, um, the quality of the buildings uh, that people are using and structures. And that includes man manufactured housing. Um, so we'll get more into that as we move on. But first, I wanted to take a look at what does the state of Colorado look like? How do we take a step back and look at what our priorities are for this state? So, we've been working with the state demographer. 
okay? And what you also read, and there's a lot of things going on in the newspapers these days, um, and one of them is that there are a lot of people moving to Colorado, a lot of people moving to the Denver metro area. Um, over 100,000 people moved last year. We don't have the final numbers this uh, yet this year, uh, but we expect it to be around 100,000 again this year. And what you can tell from this chart is that, and Ariel, excuse me, I'm gonna mm -hmm. step right over here. Um, what you can tell from this chart, uh, the dotted blue line is household growth. So that accounts for births, people moving out, that includes people moving into the state. It also accounts for people moving out and dying as well. So that's net growth. The red line is housing unit growth. And then the dotted line is vacancy rate. You can see that they're, you know, they go up and down in a pattern. Unfortunately, we are not keeping up with household growth in the state of Colorado. Now, where do people live? Um, how affordably do they live? Um, eh, some of you will be able to read this. Some of you maybe not, so let me explain it. Um, each of these bar charts, we have a group of rental units, and then on the right, we have a group of home ownership units. And on the left, with the rental units, it's actually 30% and below is the, the, the first bar. For home ownership, we don't start at 30% because there aren't a lot of folks that can afford to be in a home, own a home at 30% AMI. So that chart actually starts uh, 50%, okay? The red and the blue combined, that is the number of units in the state of Colorado that are affordable to that income level. The red indicates the households that have the opportunity to make a good financial choice for themselves, which is a good thing. So they actually are at a higher income level than the unit that they are living in. So that means they can actually save some money. What a nice opportunity to have. The blue indicates the people that actually are within that income bracket. So the point of this is, is it puts stress so that the folks at the lowest income levels have the least amount of choices because as you're at a higher AMI, you can actually rent and buy something that's affordable, even more affordable than what you could maximize. That's a good financial choice. That means that you have more money in your pocket for holiday gifts. But let's talk about medical care. Let's talk about food, those essentials. You have those uh, dollars that you have the choice to be able to use how you want to use. So I actually, this is owner and renter data. The gray chart, the gray bars show the total population by AMI and the green those are the people that are severely cost burdened. People spending more than 50% of their income toward their housing costs. And you can see as the income goes up, fewer and fewer people are severely cost burdened spending more than 50% of their income toward their housing costs. I actually have this by region in the state and I'm gonna kinda cruise through it. But what you can see as I do this the trend's the same. So statewide housing needs, in looking at those da that data, you can see that there are 153,000 very low-income households that spend more than 50% of their income toward housing costs. Now, we didn't have this in the charts, but the other thing is permanent supportive housing for homeless, that's a need. There are over 10,000, the new numbers came out since I did this, chart. Um, there are over 10,000 now. It's not nearly, it's over 10,000 homeless household or homeless people in the state of Colorado now. Rural areas. So we're talking about um, 
rehabilitation and housing needs. Our rural areas have a great need for rehabilitation. The Eastern Plains in Colorado, we have a lot of vacant, boarded up homes. We'll talk more about that in a little bit. And then attainable home ownership options. The more options people have to move from renter housing, frees up those units within the rental market so that people can, more people can live in those more affordable options for housing. So in investing in Colorado from a state perspective, we really focus on two different things. Social savers and, oops, I didn't mean to do that, and then communities with the greatest need. So what does that mean as a social saver? Well, I already mentioned homelessness, so you know, how can we have an impact in homelessness? It's also seniors keeping people in their homes as long as they can, making those modifications so that they can stay in their homes if they need accessibility improvements. And then communities with greatest needs. That's market demand. Denver has a huge market demand right now. It's also gentrifying neighborhoods, the changing. I don't know if yet today we've talked about gentrification. It's an important topic for us to address as we have so much demand for our housing stock. So real quick on social savers. The reason with public dollars there is a focus on helping people with the greatest needs, the most vulnerable, is not just because it's a good thing to do. Could Some people say it's the right thing to do. It's also because it saves public dollars. So with the investment of public dollars, you're saving public dollars. So because of, uh, with chronic homelessness and jail time, detox, hospital emergency room visits, estimates between twenty dollars and $30,000 per person can be saved. That's a strong argument for why public dollars should be invested in serving homeless populations. In addition, so I mentioned seniors and our aging uh, population in Colorado. Between living in your home with community support, having modifications so that you can stay in your home, the difference between a nursing home and staying in your home Estimates are, again, around $30,000 per person to stay in your home. So these are several of the programs that we operate. I'm not going to go through all of these, but just to give you a sense of you know, what the state is trying to do, we also have a permanent supportive housing toolkit where we bring developers and we uh, bring service providers together to try to do more. This is how we're aging. Looking at those home modifications and the need for those home modifications to keep people in their homes. In 1990, average age in Central Mountains was probably about 36 years old. Now it's 46 in 2015. And that's pretty typical uh, with the change in age throughout the state. And that's even with all of our in migration. These are the uh, cost comparisons for nursing homes versus keep people in their uh, homes for community living. Now, communities with greatest needs and how we look at our dollars for communities with the greatest needs. Rural mountains, rural central mountains. Um, I have an example of a pilot that we're doing right now. Um, in Monta Vista that I'll show you some pictures. Um, the other thing is, there are over 80,000 manufactured housing units. These are not the ones on permanent foundations in the state. These are the ones that have historically been called mobile homes. We call them manufactured housing now, but we have 80,000 of these units in our state that need attention. 
and then our tight rental markets and our gentrifying communities. How we invest our dollars makes a difference. So I mentioned a Monta Vista, um, or the Central Mountains. It's a town of 4,300 people with 114 vacant and dilapidated homes. So we have regional staff around the state, and our regional staff goes out to Monta Vista, and they're like, you know, we want to do some housing. What kind of housing? They're like, we desperately need to take care of these vacant and boarded up homes. And what it starts to remind me of, it starts to remind me of the cities 20, 30 years ago. We learned a lot with urban renewal. But there's a component of rural attention that's needed. And this is a good example of that because the number of vacant and boarded up homes, who wants to have a two or three vacant and boarded up homes on their block? I know there are still cities in the United States that have blocks like this. But in Colorado, this is more of a picture of our rural areas that we need attention. So we have a, a pilot uh, partnered with the city of Monta Vista um, where we're providing federal community development block grant dollars for the acquisition, rehabilitation, possibly even demolition, depending on what the um, needs are and what the cost effectiveness is of addressing each of the houses. But really the intent is in improving the entire community. Um, with our manufactured housing uh, section, um, we have a pilot program actually in Larimer County where we are doing an owner repair program. We've historically had owner repair programs around the state, but we have put limitations on the amount of funds that we would invest in manufactured housing because it's on a rented lot. And so as we make public investments, we want to ensure that um, we maintain that public investment. And when you're on a rented lot and you're putting that investment in, there's risk. But with 80,000 units around the state, it's a risk that we need to look at how we can best impact. And so we have this pilot program um, in Larimer County, and we're excited to see what impact we could potentially have with this and how we might be able to grow this program, um, depending on how it goes. Um, also with our manufactured housing group, uh, we have a new software called Inspect This, where you can uh, submit plans for manufactured housing online. You can pay online. Um, you can request an inspection online, and we can track. So this is something that we're beta testing right now, and we're really excited to see how it streamlines our processes. So you guys have gone through a lot of the financing um, and I see several, some of our federal funders here now. Um, and so these are just a few of the agencies at the federal, state, local level that can be your partners in preservation, um, be your partners in serving people um, in your different states. And so I know you've talked a lot about, and I don't know if you've had kind of the slide, I call this the layer cake. Because in order to do a tax credit deal in particular, it takes a lot of folks. And if you're going to serve uh, those people that are severely cost burdened, and this is the working poor actually, then it takes all of these layers to make it happen. So with that, I will. We're going to pass it. Thank you very much, Allison. We're going to pass it on to Doug. And first off, let, let me just say thank you to Doug for, for filling in for, for Rick uh, last minute. So certainly do appreciate it. Glad to have him part of the program. Thank you. Uh, as Ariel mentioned, I'm Doug Selby. I'm the housing manager for the city of Denver. Uh, pinch hitting today for my housing director, Rick Padilla. Um, the good news is I'm taller and my hair is less white. 
Uh, we'll just move on. I hope he doesn't watch this later. <laughs> just an overview for the city of Denver. What I wanted to show, you'll see a lot of charts, a lot of numbers today. Um, but just to drive that need again, um, we're seeing annual income growth throughout the city over the past few years especially. But when compared to um, this chart that shows the rent over rent e increases uh, year over year, um, the income growth has been strong since 2013, but that rent growth has been even stronger. And rent, you know, even in the third quarter of its, its old data now, but 2015 was 25% higher than it was even a year ago. And as Allison talked about, it's those AMI levels and the rent burden people at those levels. Uh, just for the city of Denver, our area median income uh, for the city is about 56,000 uh, bucks. And when you look at that 30% line, uh, you know, we circle, say, a family of two, which could be a single parent and a child. This would be a single working parent working 45 hours a week at minimum wage just to make that 30% area median income level of just over $19,000. And again, very similar to what Allison had showed statewide, we have a significant number of Denver residents that are rent burdened. Um, you can see from this chart that significant number that are rent burdened also represent more skewed towards the lower AMI levels. Um, if you look in blue, uh, this accounts for at each of those AMI levels, the number of households that are within Denver. And then the next bar is over. Sorry, I'm colorblind also. Um, the next bar is over show that cost burden. So what we're showing is just simple cost burden. They're paying over 30% of their income for rent. Um, just a note. At these affordable levels, less than 80% AMI, uh, you, folks who are cost burdened, this represents and it makes up a third of all the households in Denver. Just for some maps of what we've been doing, the Mayor Michael B. Hancock announced three and a half years ago the 3 by 5 initiative. The 3 by 5 initiative has been on my wall and is my uh, almost sole reason for existing in my job for the last three and a half years. Um, he announced that the challenge was to create or uh, preserve 3,000 units in five years within the city of Denver. And we do this through our partnerships with the state, with CHAFA, with nonprofit and for-profit developers. To date, we have produced 2,468 units. Again, I keep track of this every day. Um, we have 732 units, which are currently under construction right now. Um, we are in year four, technically, of the three by five, and so we're 82% there. In year four, 488 of those units um, have been new construction, and 147 units have been preserved. Now, before everybody gets excited about the preservation, that was mainly due to a resyndication of a 4% uh, tax credit project where we were able to add more affordability on there and preserve those for a longer period of time. And we're seeing these tax credit projects that are running off of their land use restrictions coming now for that 4% uh, incentive to keep them affordable. So why do we want to focus on this preservation in Denver? Well, as Beth had mentioned earlier, it's much more cost effective to preserve where you can. And where I say where you can is folks who do uh, the low income housing tax credit projects under new construction, uh, they come in and they can put together those projects. They have a call on the land or they own the land. They can put together all of those complex seven to nine layers of financing and they have time to do that. Where you're challenged in doing that though on a preservation project is oftentimes you're just talking a straight acquisition. And so you have to move more quickly, and you don't necessarily have the opportunity to move more quickly uh, with those subsidies that sometimes take uh, longer. Lots of those income-restricted units are you know, in, within the inventory in Denver, 
but as mentioned earlier, many of these units that we look at in the housing stock are also market units that are just inherently affordable. Again, another map, and this is available on our website at denvergov.org backslash OED. Uh, this is a map of the areas of, uh, that are vulnerable to gentrification within Denver. Um, we took um, criteria that was done out in Portland, applied it to the city of Denver, um, and looked at those areas which are quickly gentrifying or which we see as areas which are vulnerable to gentrification. What we're looking at going forward is, uh, and now, um, is a priority set to those areas and a priority for our investments. This is across the board. This is not just housing investments, but if the city goes in and they make neighborhood investments, they make workforce investments, they make business investments, we want to know that uh, we're preserving the affordability in that area as much as we can. Some of the criteria that's very interesting on uh, these areas that are vulnerable to gentrification include a median income that's lower, than the citywide average median income, and the percent of renter-occupied units uh, within those neighborhoods or that area. What you're finding is some areas have a higher percentage of owner-occupied units, and some areas have a lot of houses that are owned, um, have owners that are even out of state, but they're renting those units, and those units become very high for vulnerability to be gentrified. Again, another map. Um, just wanted to kind of show the spread of affordable income restricted units uh, throughout the city. As you can see, the city is pretty well represented geographically for a nice spread of those affordable units across the city. Um, this provides you know, better access to employment centers, schools, and community amenities. And Probably no one can read this. But when you look at the scope of the problem, um, when we look at those uh, units which we are identifying as, hey, there's a risk that these could come offline for their affordability, um, we looked at uh, those covenant restricted units and kind of project that forward five years. And the number fluctuates up and down by folks who renew their housing uh, HAP contracts or those Section 8 contracts, but generally it runs around 2,700 at any one time for the next five years that are at risk of losing their affordability. And the preservation uh, ordinance. As talked about before, we've had a preservation ordinance that was originally adopted in 2002. Uh, we updated this ordinance in partnership with the National Housing Trust, Mile High Connects, Enterprise Community Partners, um, who had come to us with a study that said, hey, it's great you have an ordinance, but there's some improvements we think you could look at. The main thing about the improvements that we put into the ordinance, uh, I think there were three main uh, changes to that ordinance that improved it and strengthened it. Uh, this was the lengthening of time of the notifications for folks who want to opt out. We had a time that was sub 200 days on some of these uh, shorter term contracts that we moved to say, if you're going to opt out of the affordability of your unit, we want a year's notice for that. Um, it allows us more time to put those partnerships together to inspect the units, to look at them, and maybe to negotiate to keep those affordable. Uh, we had also, which I think this is huge also, is we previously did not have covered under the preservation uh, ordinance units in which were just straight tax credit projects. So if we didn't put money in them or there were no federal funds in them, they were not covered before, even though they had a land use restriction from the Colorado Housing Finance Authority, and we included those under the uh, ordinance. Um, and then biggest and the most important thing uh, that we had done was we provided for a first rider refusal by the city or its designee on those properties that were put up for sale. So it doesn't matter if you have a affordability covenant that's running 20 years, 30 years, or two years. We have a first rider refusal to come in and say, 
hey, can we negotiate uh, for us or a designee to purchase this? Not negotiate, I'm sorry. We have a first right of refusal on that purchase and sale agreement, the offer that's there at the same terms. As with this, we run into the limitations of our abilities to enact to preserve units. Um, the limitations on the preservation ordinance are, of course, it doesn't cover those units that are market rate. So if they're inherently affordable, um, we, don't, we don't have a way ordinance wise to come in and have a first right of refusal or even to uh, come in and negotiate from a strength position. What we have that we've just launched and we had it in front of a developer group and we will be displaying this on our website also, is we're coming out with new buckets of products uh, for our financing uh, tools going forward. This is our federal financing and this would include our local city financing. So we have a 9% product, we have a 4% product, and then we have an acquisition product, we have a land bank product, and we have a specific rehabilitation product. So if there is a market rate unit out there, and they're looking to do some rehab on their unit, uh, we would offer maybe better terms, maybe uh, an incentive to keep those at a rent level that is already inherently affordable, and somebody could enact on a product to fix up their property. When I talk about some of our implementation strategies, as Beth had mentioned, our partnership with the state, HUD and Chaffa, um, have been paramount in moving forward with a strategy for this preservation. Um, we want to strengthen our outreach and addressing the preservation, again, with the new products that I had just mentioned and our marketing of those products to folks who maybe haven't engaged in the affordable realm before. Because, as you know, in Colorado, we kind of all know each other in Colorado if you're in the affordable realm. It's a very tight little business. But folks outside of that realm, it, it may seem cloudy or it may seem uh, magic or things go on behind closed doors when really we're talking about straight up financing products and let me put a covenant on the property. Um, we're talking about direct acquisitions. Uh, we're targeting some areas for direct acquisitions. Again, we have a land bank product. This will become probably more used as the market slows down. If everybody can remember just a short time back to 2008, 9, and 10, when we were all having conferences about foreclosures, not as much was going on in tax credit uh, creation. Uh, we at the city had doubled down on our tenant-based rental assistance program, but it backed off from uh, the actual creation of units. But now what we're looking at is that would be an optimal time to acquire land, maybe at lower prices, that could be developed when the market gets hot again like it is right now. Um, we're exploring policies for tax rebates as part of our plans, and we're exploring other uh, models that we may use in the market rate affordable. What we have right now is part of the preservation ordinance that's very interesting. It says if the city invests in a rental product, then we must uh, covenant, um, put a covenant on the rental product for no less than 20 years. And the financing products that I just mentioned, we are going no less than 30 years on our covenant. But by ordinance, we could go no less than 20. This could be a big kind of scare for those market rate products, and so engages us to do more of our education and outreach about what that actually looks like, what rent levels that restricts, what we might negotiate for a certain number of units in that building. And I'll be available for questions afterwards. Thank you. Doug, thanks so much. Uh, so we're gonna be moving on to DASA. So Allison started state level, um, Doug, as far as the city, and then DASA is kind of a blend, so kind of regional and bringing it all together, so. DASA. That's right. Um, 
Am I, this mic's on, right? Yeah. Um, we made it, guys. This is the last PowerPoint uh, that we're going to watch. Does anyone need to like shake it out a little bit or stand up? Feel free. Uh, I, I won't be offended. And I think I have zero charts in this presentation, so um, maybe no numbers either. Um, but uh, for those of you that I haven't met, just to give you a little bit of context, Mile High Connects is a six-year-old partnership um, that was really created um, out of the idea that housing and transportation are the two largest costs oftentimes in families' budgets. And as we were starting to build out fast tracks, unless we really thought about the connection between affordable housing and our expanding transit system, we were going to miss the opportunity to really create benefit, particularly for low-income communities and communities of color. Now, over time, our work has evolved. Uh, we think very comprehensively about communities. So now it's not just about housing and transportation, but also about quality education, healthy environments, fresh food, local jobs, those kinds of things. But this idea of preservation is one that has always been baked in for us. And in fact, the very first thing that the partners of Mile Connects did together was really create a financing tool that was designed to preserve both affordable housing that existed in places that we knew that light rail was going to be coming, and to pre preserve the possibility of creating affordable housing in those same locations. Um, over time, we've really had the opportunity to, to go deep into this question of preservation, and it's actually been awesome to sit here over the course of, of the day and listen to so many of our partners describing initiatives um, that we've helped to seed and to grow over time. Um, so Laura described um, the study that we did with the National Housing Trust just a couple of years ago. Um, and that was really our opportunity to sit down with the city of Denver and say, there are some things that we can be doing differently on a systemic level um, to be able to, uh, to create um, a priority around preservation. So the preservation ordinance that uh, Doug just described came out of that, and the Colorado Preservation, or the Housing Preservation Network that Beth described was the other really core recommendation. Um, we were able to develop the early warning system, now the Colorado Preservation Database. Um, and so what we're really talking about is how, as a community, we layer strategies on to be able to get smarter, to be able to be more effective, and to be able to consider opportunities both from a policy perspective and from a resource perspective that lets us drive more deeply um, and different communities that we work in across the metro area are in different places around this work. Um, you know, I would say in the city of Denver, um, from a policy perspective, we're probably the furthest ahead. Um, the preservation ordinance and now the kind of revisiting to see what we might be able to do to go deeper is a big one. But we also have a commitment to working with the Housing Preservation Network and other jurisdictions across the metro area to emerge their own preservation ordinances in ways that make sense for them. We know that contexts are different in some of the suburban communities, um, but there is a real need for, for um, making sure that we're preserving. Uh, um, affordable housing in, in those places as well. Though what we're seeing more and more in our suburban partners is that that question of naturally affordable, uh, naturally occurring affordable is really the million dollar question. So the strategies that Ravi was describing around energy efficiency and other upgrades and retrofits is one that we're really working with a number of jurisdictions to explore and to drive deeper around what kind of covenant can we put on as a result of making those investments with local dollars and and how might we, um, how, how might we at least use that in this gap period when our market is kind of at its height of heat? Um, and there are some places around our region that are starting to see the displacement pressures, um, but that there's still really opportunity to capture some of that housing. I will say I was very glad to hear Allison mention uh, manufactured housing. That's a real space of preservation that I think is very important, particularly in Adams County. Um, we've been working pretty deeply. Uh, we worked deeply with the city of Denver um, earlier this year around some pieces. Adams County, Aurora, um, uh, Sydney was here a little bit earlier. Um, and it's a complicated question because there are, in some cases, some very, very real financial infrastructure needs. For us, from a planning perspective, the manufactured housing that exists near transit is not necessarily the kind of highest and best use from a land use perspective. Um, but it is critically important for those hundreds and hundreds and thousands of families those units, and frankly, right now, can't find another thing at that same level of affordability, particularly in the ownership space. Another strategy that hasn't come up as much today, um, 
but is this question of community land trusts. Um, and so some conversations um, around, uh, around how we build not only the opportunity for uh, organizations to purchase properties um, that may be at risk, risk of losing affordability, but how we actually build those opportunities in communities themselves as a community wealth building strategy. So we're deep in the middle of conversations and um, some exploration and early stage feasibility work in Globe Villa Larry Swansea, which um, which Katie mentioned uh, a little bit earlier today, um, and also have a couple of other places around the metro area that we're really looking at that as a strategy so that um, communities themselves have the opportunity to buy either single or multifamily units and be able to, um, to, to, to hire someone to own and manage them in a, in a way that you know, Laura was describing as a strategy that's used in a lot of other places um, around the nation that we haven't used very deeply here in the metro area. There are only a couple of, of community land trusts that we have as examples. Um, the other piece that I would mention from a policy perspective that hasn't come up as much today, but that I think is really important um, for us to be thinking about in this conversation, um, is that it's not just about the preservation of units, but the preservation of people's opportunity to stay in those units. Um, so a huge amount of work um, right now in conversation with a number of jurisdictions around protections for tenants um, and renters. And um, Colorado is one of the um, kind of weakest tenant protection states in the nation. Um, it's really important when we think about preserving affordability that we also really preserve the opportunity for people to live in intact communities. The last thing that I want to mention is um, a strategy that we've been working on for about the last year and a half, or evolving for about the last year and a half, um, that's really about trying to get some more dollars into the system. Um, so we've been uh, part of a small cohort of places that also include the Bay Area and Los Angeles um, that are being supported by the Kresge Foundation to explore um, something that, that they call capital absorption, which really just means how, as a community, are you ready to take in forms of capital and put it to use? And so have been working with a large variety of partners, many of you in the room, um, around this question of what does our environment look like? Do we know what our priorities are? Do we have a pipeline of deals that we know are ready to go um, if we have investment that's ready to go as well? And what kind of policy context and other elements of an enabling environment do we have in place? So the project has done a number of things over its time together. We have a development pipeline that we've uh, put together in partnership with Dr. Cog. I see Flo sitting there. Thanks for your work in that. Uh, we have a pipeline of tenants that can go into uh, uh, developments that are built and need, um, need some community serving folks um, in their commercial and retail space. Um, but a really big piece of this has been that we know that there's capital out there in the system um, writ large that we're not capturing in the community development space, right? We tend to go to the same funding sources, um, foundations, banks um, and put together these, we've gotten very good at creating these kind of very discrete um, structured funds. Um, so the Denver Transit Oriented Development Fund, the Fresh Food Financing Fund, right? We have these kind of 25 million revolving loan funds that stack capital and we're great at that. Um, but what we're really missing in the system is the opportunity to weave those together and to have capital that can be flexible, that can be deployed rapidly in the way that Beth was describing, um, and that really is something that has terms that can start to capture folks who are in the private sector impact investing community, who have lots of capital to deploy, um, but don't necessarily think of community development and real estate in that space. And so we've been spending a lot of time talking with that, that segment of, uh, of financial investors to understand what their needs are, what do they mean by impact investing? Could they think of real estate as impact investment? It's actually a more secure thing than some of the small business things that they're investing in currently. Um, and have been able, out of that, to really start to envision um, what looks like this new source of flexible capital um, that will allow um, investors to come in, both our traditional investors who come in through, um, you know, for example, 
program related investments for our foundation community, um, some of the community reinvest reinvestment act dollars through our banks, um, but also allow those private sector impact investors to come in into a structure that really builds a scaffolding between the funds that we have in place that allows us to build out those sleeves that we know are missing and preservation is really at the top of the list there. That ability to really rapidly deploy that capital in a way that gets us um, the ability to activate these preservation ordinances in a meaningful way, um, as well as support communities who may want to build that as well. I don't think this graphic really shows um, well. I don't think it should be kind of a house at the top. It really should be a, whip, a, a ribbon waving uh, through. Um, Chaffa has been a really important partner for us in this. Um, they manage so many of these funds already and have such a high level of expertise in underwriting um, that we're really looking at them as a, as a potential kind of hub um, for this work. But I wanted to let folks know that that's something that's evolving. And if you have an interest in being involved in that conversation, um, we're really welcoming thought partners um, into that space. So with that, let's, uh, let's go into some discussion. All right, great. Would you guys, can we, will you join me in thanking all of the presenters first off? Thank you. Tell you what, so let's kick it off with, with some questions. So questions from the audience that might be out there? We have a microphone available. So if there's a hand, I always have questions. So then I'll go. Uh, Allison, for you in regards to, and also um, Desa mentioned the manufactured housing. You mentioned there's a pilot program. Anything that you can share as far as details on the pilot time frame and what you're looking for and what kind of uh, uh, are you defining as success to then repeat? Mm -hmm. So uh, initially, it is with one of our traditional partners, uh, the Leveland Housing Authority in particular. Um, they have an owner repair program throughout Larimer County um, and parts of Weld, actually. And so uh, based on the housing stock that they have there, they identified this as a need. And it, you know, honestly, it's a need that we have throughout the state. So we're planning to assess this as uh, they uh, manage this over the next year and hopefully roll uh, something out um, with our other partners that we have around the state in next year, year and a half would be my hope. And basically we've always done uh, emergency repairs uh, for manufactured housing and capped it at $5,000 and that simply was not enough uh, because some, when someone has a roof caving in, they likely have you know, a furnace that's also not working. And so we were finding that we were quickly getting um, beyond that cap. And so uh, we're increasing the cap, um, and I believe it was uh, 10 to 15,000, I'm not, I don't remember the exact number, um, per unit. And the hope was to go in and be able to do all life safety things um, that were needed and uh, possibly the other improvements that might also be needed as a betterment. Questions from the audience? Have a microphone in the back. <laughs> All right. Doug, question for you. So you mentioned the, the three by five and congratulations on almost 2,500 units uh, ahead of schedule. Uh, recently, as far as the city council, the 150 million over 10 years yeah. uh, that's gonna be available. Anything that you can share in regards to um, thoughts as to how the, the, the funds will be utilized and what go, it might be going towards the preservation versus new construction? Absolutely. Um, so yes, we had just, uh, the city council uh, a couple months ago had just passed um, our first sustained uh, affordable housing fund for the city, uh, creating this sustained way to um, get affordable housing monies that were non-federal, which we've seen a huge cut in those federal funds over the past few years. And this fund is um, projected to be $150 million over the next 10 years. And what we've done, again, as I talked about those uh, financing products, mm -hmm. is we've aligned those with buckets that we see coming into us. Again, that 9% product, uh, the 4% product, a non-tax credit deal product on an acquisition or a rehab. Um, we have a home ownership product. And what's exciting about this is we have a way to deploy these funds immediately into what we're projecting is going to be another hot year for development in Denver. Um, and we have targeted those funds to also turn from a cash flow type of loan 
into a performance base loan, which for non-housing folks out there, that means a grant. As long as you do what you said you were going to do, this will be forgiven. Um, that's targeted. It turns into a performance loan if you achieve a higher level of lower AMI units in your project. No, we have a question in the back. Yeah, I'm uh, Maria Sepulveda with Wells Fargo. I have a question for you, Allison. You mentioned, um, I think the gap was at 135,000 in terms of affordable housing need. Was did I read that wrong? Um, so in your presentation, no, no, you're good. You're good. <laughs> it was uh, 150,000 households at 30% AMI that were severely cost burdened. Okay. Well, and I was curious about whether there's any statistics on what percentage of that is senior need, just because I know that that's such a growing need. That's one question. And then the second question is about, um, you mentioned that um, in terms of meeting the need of seniors, um, affordable housing need, one of the very cost effective ways is to help seniors stay in their homes. What kinds of programs, if you could just elaborate a little more on what kinds of programs are available now or even just best practices that we're, you're hoping that we could employ in the future? Absolutely. Um, so yes, we do have data for seniors on cost burden, um, and we have that broken down by renter and owner occupied. Um, and so the challenge, though, is is that uh, this data is all from the census, and it's based on income. And so if you have investments <coughs> that you're not pulling down from, it's not income necessary, it's an asset. And so it's challenging to look at the data and know 100% what you're looking at. So, so that is the challenge. We know that there's a need. We know that we're all getting older. It's just a fact. And uh, as a state, uh, we are also, on average, getting older as well. Um, with the uh, home modification program, that's actually a Medicaid program. and. Um, we went through, the state goes through uh, a lean process um, when we identify that um, we have, or maybe there's a program that isn't as efficient as we would like it to be. So we partnered with uh, HICPUF, which is the healthcare uh, Medicaid agency in the state, and we sat down in a room, closed the doors for a week, and figured out that we had owner repair programs and they had Medicaid modification programs. We do housing, they do health care. So there was a cross, but they were making payments like their service providers. And so it made sense to be partnered with us where we had contractors that we were working with that would inspect things. So it's a Medicaid funded program. Um, there's a maximum lifetime benefit of $14,000 per person. And how that works is you apply through um, your uh, Medicaid provider, and then they're partnered with our owner repair program. Um, and so whatever the accessibility needs are that you have in your particular home, um, whether it is you know, doorknobs or ramps, um, the two agencies will work together to get those modifications done. Um, and, you know, that's something that we brought in to administer just a couple years ago. So that partnership is, is pretty new at this point, and we're really excited how it's uh, moving forward. I have one for Desa. As far as uh, you mentioned the development pipeline, what's the geography that's going to be covered as far as... Uh for those deals? Uh, right now, the pipeline matches uh, matches the geographies that we work in. So it's, uh, it's really the seven county metro area. Our, our geographic area really mirrors RTDs, so, so I guess seven and a half counties. Um, but uh, Dr. Cog, uh, Dr. Cog has a little bit larger geography, and you can envision over time that it could expand. Okay. All right. One that just came from the audience, questions? Oh, right up here in front. Oh, microphone's on its way, right behind you. Thank you. Could you describe some of the potential renter and tenant protections that might be coming down? Yeah, um, we're really trying to vet what can happen at a local and regional level versus what's more appropriate at a state level. Um, there are definitely some uh, legal preclusions um, right now that um, 
that put a set of kind of boundaries or guardrails up um, around, um, around what's possible. So some of the things that have been really kind of top of mind for community residents as we've been talking with them um, and seem to be having some resident resonance uh, within some of the grass tops conversations that we've been having as well are just some really basic things around notice. Um, so notice, um, so just the amount of time um, that people have um, around um, both increases in their rents um, as, well as, uh, as well as notice of evictions. Um, there are some elements around strengthening just habitability requirements, so um, just the kind of quality um, in, which, uh, in which people are living. Um, we're seeing a lot of kind of interesting things as people are trying to stay in communities and maybe losing specific housing. So um, for example, we're seeing some landlords that are charging application fees um, at 25 bucks a pop to like 100 different applicants for a single unit. Um, and so we're trying to sort through um, an intervention that, that, that might be there. Um, and background checks, um, particularly for folks who have been evicted at some point historically, um, it's very, very difficult to get into another unit. We had a woman that we met who was 32 trying to get into a unit and uh, they did a background check that went back 30 years. I don't know what she would have been doing at age two that would have necessitated that kind of a, of a check. You know, so it's, some of this is just really, really basic. Um, you know, there's certainly lots of conversation around the community about things like rent control um, that was being asked about earlier. And because of the Telluride Amendment, that doesn't feel like it's something that's, um, that makes sense to, you know, to take on. And there's also questions amongst our partners about whether that's, uh, whether that's the strongest strategy. But we think that there are things um, that can help support folks who are living in those units right now, particularly because we're seeing so many people um, going on very short-term leases um, because so many of the landlords, just by, by nature of the market, um, know that there's lots of opportunity coming down the pipe. This might be more Chaffa-specific because it's uh, tied to LIHTC, but I'll throw it out to the panel. Uh, as far as uh, basically saying in regards to LIHTC and the long lead time, are you familiar or aware of any initiatives or activities to to basically speed up the process and, and address the completion timeframes so that uh, uh, financing tools can be used for more developments, et cetera. So anything to, that you're hearing about speeding up the process with tax credits? With tax credits? I, I would I don't know if, to... Yeah, exactly. I, that's what I was thinking. <laughs> if there's uh, folks from Chaffa that would like to, to comment, this was from a stream. Do you want the microphone? Microphone's coming your way. Uh, if you could, yeah, thank you. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Masuda Omar. I'm in the community development area of Chaffa. Um, I, um, as you all know, Chaffa administers the low income housing tax credit program. My role's a little bit different. I'm more on the lending side of affordable housing, but I can certainly speak a little bit as far as what Chaffa has done and what it's going to do to, in order to expedite the uh, production of affordable housing units. Um, one thing that we're considering for 2017 is actually forward committing the state low income housing tax credit program um, to the tune of $10 million. So when the state LIHTC was ex um, recapitalized in 2015, um, it was going to be paired primarily with 4% um, tax credit projects as well as partnering with the Colorado Division of Housing to um, uh, place uh, credits to uh, communities that were impacted by flooding with CDBG disaster funds. That was very successful, but the last um, uh, funding for CDBG was done this year. I know, I think the OH still has some funds available or may have some funds available, um, but going into 2017 and 2018, again, we're looking at forward committing the state tax credit. So that's about 10 million that will be available. Um, and then we're also um, looking at, there's certainly 13 million that's available through the 9% tax credit program. I know our tax credit team is actually looking at the timing of the tax credit round, certainly in the last couple of weeks with the um, impact of the election and the uncertainty around um, the 
new administration, there's a little bit of a frenzy in the LIHTC equity market that's starting to impact some of the projects, so we're watching that. So that may impact the timing of the tax credit round. That hasn't been determined yet. Um, but certainly, I think with the work that um, with the state, certainly with the city of Denver, the preservation initiative, there's a lot, I think, that is happening in terms of just working together, joint underwriting with the permanent supportive housing um, units through the toolkit program. And so I think that that has to continue. I think, if anything, um, those the collaborations and those partnerships are going to be even more critical as we enter into 2017 to make sure that there's not going to impact because the need is not going away. The need, in fact, is going to be greater. So I don't know if that answers the question, but again, we are actively working with our partners. All right. Thanks so much and appreciate it. I just uh, Googled the area code and that's from a question from Missouri, so I'm not sure if that, uh, how that worked, but thanks so much. Appreciate that. So I've got three boys and, and we're always talking about, you know, what's on the wish list and so forth. So I'm going to ask the panelists as far as what's on your wish list for 2017. What are some things that perhaps you'd like to see uh, in regards to whether it's a new ordinance, whether it's a new funding source? What would be helpful in your area, uh, perhaps that we don't have in place, but you'd like to see in the future? Maybe it's not 2017, but uh, coming up. <laughs> um, you know, I, I think, you know, to build on what Masuda was saying about the partnerships, um, I do think that they're critical. And I think that, um, you know, we've had really great success when we have partnered. Um, and so I would like to see those continue to grow because I think that we can get a lot more done when we do it that way. Um, and that goes with our partner state agencies as well. And I'm not just talking housing. I'm actually at an all-day human services uh, meeting today, and I just stepped out. Thank you. Um, and so um, there's a lot of uh, data needs so that we can better understand um, where our greatest needs are. I mean, right now we have really good information on income, um, but as we talk about, um, you know, partnerships with Department of Corrections or with uh, behavioral health um, or with uh, our healthcare systems, um, you know, it's complex and there are a lot of great needs out there and I think that we can have um, a greater impact on the overall um, effort that each of our agencies are, are working toward um, through those partnerships. Um, but since we're all using different data systems and we're all collecting and looking at things a little bit differently, it sure would be great if there was uh, even greater coordination to get the data together. And then, of course, um, together with that, uh, the governor does have a new budget um, that includes new funding sources for housing in the state of Colorado. And, um, you know, it, there's a long public process ahead. And uh, it'll be really interesting to see how that goes. But I think that there could be great impact um, if the governor's budget uh, moves forward. So one of the things that I did hear was data, as far as data, as far as not data gaps that exist. Uh, okay, wonderful, thank you. Doug? Uh, completion of the three by five. Um, <laughs> that's what I'm looking for in year four. Uh, going ahead, and it touches upon your question about efficiencies in deployment of these funds and those actually turning into units, because it's great to announce hey, we just awarded this much money into this project, and people drive out there, actually, and it's a blank piece of dirt. And they're like, wait a minute, when, you know, when can I get on the list? And so uh, one of the initiatives that we will complete in 2017 is, that we're working with the Colorado Housing Finance Authority um, and the state is uh, one application resource. And so you can do an aligned application. This will work for the customers out there, the developers, in timing. And so they don't have to go, OK, I got my tax credits. Now I'll come to you, state. And now I'll come to you, city. And even Federal Home Loan Bank. Now I'll go to you for AHP funds. Uh, we, can, we can shorten that time and give them more predictability for their investors. Um, and what that is a very long way of saying um, we are going to shorten the time by which a shovel will go into a ground 
and a unit will be finished. I second that. See, <laughs> I, I, I contributed. <laughs> More wisdom. Tessa. Um, I would say for me there's two things. Um, it, one is that um, it was a really big deal for us to pass a dedicated revenue source in the city of Denver this year, right? I mean, lots of controversy about it. That's a huge thing. It's the first time that that's happened in the state of Colorado. And I would love to see us get to something like that at a statewide level. That but we it's really also have. recognized nationally, correct? I mean. It's, 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 a big, it, it's, it's a big deal. It's, it's a big thing. And I think it's something that, as a city that's growing up, is something that, that, that we need, right? Um, and so at a state level, I would love to see us do something similar to really pass a dedicated, permanent um, even, uh, source of, of revenue that we can use that, um, that has the ability to prioritize and fund preservation. And then the second thing is there's so much energy in so many communities in the metro area around this question of the market rate or the naturally occurring affordable housing. I think we've made a huge amount of progress and I feel awesome about the work that Beth is doing um, at Chaffa around really coordinating our work around the restricted affordable. And I would love to see us as a, as a broader community have a regional comprehensive strategy around how we're gonna tackle that issue before it's too late. Questions from the audience? This is gonna be the last, one of the last opportunities. All right, with that, will you join me again in thanking our panelists today? <laughs> this panel, I should say. And also, I'd like to, to thank uh, all of the speakers today and would like to thank you as far as the audience here in Denver. Uh, hearty souls, maybe it's now up to 10 degrees outside, I don't know haven't been out, uh, but also would like to thank the, those folks that streamed for the conversation, were part of this conversation uh, throughout the state, the, 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 my gosh, in about 15 states. And reminder to you, uh, you have an evaluation in your packet. If you wouldn't mind completing that for us, please. Again, it helps us as far as for our 2017 program. What's helpful? What, what are some of the changes? What are some of the new things that you'd like to see in the discussion? Uh, because we'd like to be part of that conversation. Again, thank you very much for being part of the present or part of the program today and joining us. So we are adjourned. Thanks. <laughs>